It's Tuesday, the 5th of April, 2016. This is Newsroom on SABC News, Channel 404, Jumbo, Africa. And a very warm welcome as we broadcast live from our Auckland Park studios in Johannesburg, South Africa, to the rest of the African continent. I'm Elvis Presley. And I'm Renee Best. And we will be with you until 12 o'clock. We're also streaming live on YouTube with the entire show now available on our YouTube channel. We're asking you a question today. We're talking about gangsterism. That's our theme for today, Cape Ganglands, as well as other areas. And we're asking you what else can be done to rid our communities from these gangs. How do we purge these, uh, the gangsterism in our communities? Let me know what's on your mind on the Twitter handle at SABC Newsroom and on our Facebook page. Uh, but first, let's take a look at all your news headlines. Opposition parties in Parliament to push for a secret ballot in their bid to remove President Jacob Zuma from office. The DA writes to Johannesburg. The DA writes to Johannesburg Metro requesting an urgent special council meeting over the picket up strike. And authorities, including the South African Revenue Services, take a very close look at local companies and citizens implicated in the so-called Panama Papers. Now, those are all your headlines. But uh, before we get to the news, let's find out from Kendall. Mark Lamarte, what's happening on the sports front? A very good morning to you, Kendall. Good morning both, uh, to both of you. It's good to be back here. Look, quite a lot happening on the footballing front, and I want to greet our viewers as well before I get too far ahead of myself. Uh, good morning to you, and uh, welcome to the show. The last spot for the Nedbank Cup, last 16, will get decided in a 20 derby. This between Super Sports United and the University of Pretoria tonight. And staying with football, Barcelona and Atletico Madrid face off in the business end of the UEFA Champions League. All this as the FIFA Ethics Committee investigates one of its own members, Juan Pedro Damian. Corruption and the innuendos do not seem to stop at FIFA, but we'll be covering all of that at about 10.20 or so. Back to you, Elvis and Rene. Thank you, Kendall. Now, it's time for Renee to give you the news. Some opposition parties in Parliament are expected to push for a secret ballot today during the National Assembly motion to remove President Jacob Zuma from office. Meanwhile, the ANC's National Working Committee met at an undisclosed venue in Cape Town yesterday to consider last week's Constitutional Court ruling. The Democratic Alliance, who called for the motion, says the matter transcends party politics and affects all South Africans. It's not the DA's first attempt to remove the president, but this time the party says it's backed by a court. Last week, the Constitutional Court ordered the president to pay for non-security upgrades at his Nkandla residence, as instructed by the public protector. For the very first time since the 1994 election, we have the highest court in the land, the Constitutional Court, that has now found that the President conclusively violated uh, the Constitution, violated his oath of office and did not behave in a lawful manner. And that is a very clear trigger of Section 89 of the Constitution. There is no other time when it has been more important than now, because the Constitutional Court declared that President Zuma violated the Constitution, and to that extent, uh, he must be removed, and the perfect body to do so is Parliament. You must exhaust that avenue uh, if there is to be something beyond Parliament that can be done. The Freedom Front Plus calls it a historic event. Last time they did not listen to reason, they listened to their party caucus and their party decisions, and the Constitutional Court found that decision of them to be unconstitutional. We hope that common sense will prevail. We, have, we really appeal to all ANC members to vote in terms of their conscience. They've all uh, was responsible and, and, and they all know what needs to be done. No member of a political party uh, or no member of any political party since 1994 has ever voted differently from the party line. Even those uh, opposition parties, they will be voting in accordance with their party line. 
why would they expect differently from the ANC? That is uh, just sheer uh, hypocrisy. The IFP says it's still deciding which route to take, while the UDM wouldn't divulge its plans. Abra Barbia, SABC News, Parliament. The DA has written to the Speaker of the Johannesburg Metro, Constance Papela, requesting her to urgently convene a special council meeting to discuss the picket-up strike. The National Institute for Communicable Diseases has also called for an urgent intervention as people become exposed to health risks because of uncollected waste. Flies and rats, the biggest problem now. Flies can transmit germs mechanically on their legs, so that's one issue. Um, people handling the rubbish or playing in it, as children might do, uh, might be exposed to, to various uh, pathogens. A number of risks from rodents. They uh, can attack people, they can bite them, they can transmit infections either directly by their bites or from their excretions. An appeal by the Gauteng Health Department. Yes, we understand the workers' issues that are very central. It's about their well-being and we'll never uh, downplay those issues. But also the workers must be, have a full understanding of the impl impact and the implications of the uncollected rubbish over such a prolonged period of time. As incidents of intimidation continue, pick it up workers aren't budging. We are still saying, as the employees of pick it up, we'll go back to work, provided the employers keep the employer give us money. Negotiations have deadlocked. The city has established a joint operations center to identify hot spots for agent attention. Mahiketla Mutabe, SABC News, Alexandra. Liquidators, the Financial Services Board and the South African Revenue Services are now taking a hard look at South African companies and citizens implicated in the so-called Panama Papers leak. Among them are investment company Fidentia and President Jacob Zuma's nephew, Kulubuse Zuma. The documents show that at least two of the men involved in the Fidentia fraud used the firm to create offshore companies. And an estimated 1.2 billion rand was misappropriated in the Fidentia scandal. More than 60,000 people, including widows and orphans of mine workers who were beneficiaries of the Fidentia Controlled Trust, were affected. The leaked documents purport to show that Kulubuse Zuma was allegedly authorized to represent Capricat Limited, one of two offshore companies that acquired oil fields in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2010. But Zuma's spokesperson, Vuyom Kize, says Zuma had never owned an offshore bank account or used one to move finances. This revelation comes as liquidators attempt to recover losses from 2009 mining deal involving Zuma's Aurora Empowerment Systems. That's your news for this hour. It's back to you, Elvis. Thank you, Renee. And of course, you will be back later with a full bulletin, so you'll have to stay tuned. Now remember that we're asking you that question today in relating to gangs and that's our discussion and our theme for today. We're looking at gang related incidents and gang violence as well as the growth of gangs and what else do you think we can do as a society to purge our, our society and our communities of gangs? That's the question to you. would like to find out from you what's on your mind on the Twitter handle at SABC Newsroom as well as on the Facebook page. By the way, if you like us there on the Facebook page, you become part and parcel of the informed. Our theme now today, some residents of Paul in the Bolan say they are living in fear as an alleged gang war intensifies in the area. Several people have been injured and houses set alight in the lower Paul area recently. Youth aged between 10 and 13 from Chicago, Magnolia and Lantana flats have been blamed for causing the mayhem. Chicago in Lower Paul a battleground for drug dealers and gangs as they fight over territory. A three-year-old girl was recently raped here. In the area is nothing to do with it. It's the people in the area. It's the people is all sick because why? How can a person do it to a three-year-old person, a three-year-old child that can't defend herself? Residents say they've seen an escalation in the violence in recent weeks. Stones and petrol bombs are used as weapons. We are fed up about the gangsters because it's a school outdrops. 
the children from about 12 to 13 years old who are joining the gangs. But because there is big guys sitting who are behind the gangsters here. But especially it's the youth who are dropping out of schools who are making gangs here. Lantana Flats, another no-go area. The SABC crew was accompanied by police to ensure their safety. Graffiti on the walls, a clear sign of marked gang territory. Normally prevalent on the Cape Flats, it seems the gang problem is spreading to other areas in the Cape. A march has been held in the area to call for help. The new Western Cape Provincial Police Commissioner has promised to end gangsterism in the province. This community say they want action now. Nomao Tusolwantle, SABC News, Paul in the Western Cape. Now the Social Justice Coalition has launched an application in the Western Cape High Court to demand more police resources for, for poor black communities. The coalition want the police minister, Nartin Tleko, to provide better resources in the Western Cape and KwaZulu-Natal. Makasa is one of the crime-ridden areas in Kailicha, and the nearest police station is more than five kilometers away. Now, set was, site, uh, was set aside for a police station in 2004, but a brick is yet to be laid. Now, residents say they are tired of crime in the area. J.P. Smith is the mayoral committee member, safety and security in Cape Town. Uh, he's joining us in our Cape Town studios. And we're also joined in the Cape Town studios by investigative journalist and TV producer Hazel Friedman, who won the Vodacom Western Cape TV Journalist of the Year in 2014 for her story on special assignment on, the, uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on her Cape story. It was called, let me just see here. Um, and Hazel will probably tell us. Let me just welcome my guest first. A, a very good morning to you and welcome. Morning. Morning. Thank you for letting us be here. Uh, JP, let me start off with you first and foremost. Now, we just saw in that package before that the gang activity now extending to the Pal. Um, are we seeing an expansion, perhaps, of the, the gang empires from the Cape uh, into, the, into, into the rural areas? Oh, perhaps let me just start by reminding you that I can speak only for what happens in Cape Town. I have no jurisdiction beyond that. And unfortunately, the primary entity involved in this discussion should be SEPs and they're not part of this discussion this morning. But that said, um, I think, yes, I was in Port Elizabeth yesterday walking with residents um, in Galvandale. They have very serious gang problems there. They've got 50 murders since the beginning of January. I think what you've seen across South Africa is the meltdown of policing strategy towards gang violence. It is unfortunately so that whilst in the past we have intermittently seen improvements in the crime stats, uh, the periods during which crime has indeed in many parts of South Africa and in many aspects have reduced. That is not true for the last two years where we've seen escalations in, in many of the um, uh, serious violent crime categories. And unfortunately, it's particularly untrue of gang violence because we have a 2% conviction rate. And I understand PE told me yesterday there is a 4% conviction rate for gang murders. That means your gangsters have long and prosperous careers unless they're killed by each other. Unfortunately, the police and the current policing strategy around gangsters is not able to take them out of the equation. And uh, this, I think, is mainly due to the disestablishment of the specialized units before and the fact that not a, a, enough focused prosecutorial resources are being spent on pursuing these gangsters, building cases against them and making sure that they're put away. Uh, there might also be problems around police collusion and corruption. So within that context, there's a little bit that the city can do, but not a great deal. Um, we only control 3% of the policing resources in Cape Town and none of the criminal justice system. That said, we have embarked on very particular and focused strategies. And if you look at gang violence in Cape Town from uh, last year till now, you see we dropped 19% in gang violence, whilst around the rest of the country, your murder rate and your murders increased. We had a reduction in, in gang violence, and I think that's not an insignificant achievement. That shows that our specialized policing strategy around the gang and drug task team, and particularly our stabilization unit and our school resource officers, have been um, paying dividends. Mm -hmm. Now, Hazel, let me come back to you. Your documentary uh, on duplicity uh, of uh, the Cape gangs. Tell me more about that and why did you embark on that particular story? It was a very strange and perplexing story. Um, I called it duplicity because that exactly is what was going on in terms of police being, well, I think it was Jeremy Berry who said they were being uh, economical with the truth in terms of disclosure of it basically revolved around the story of a young woman who was responsible for putting Rashid Stahi 
in prison for rape. Um, her life fell apart through drugs and uh, trauma. And shortly before his due release, she was, uh, she was targeted for assassination. We were all led to believe that she had died. And at the moment when we had actually announced who she was and that she had died, we were informed that in fact it was a ruse, that she was alive and well, and well, not, not well, but had been taken into a witness protection program, which in effect really just exposed her again to whoever was looking for her and could come after her. Um, and it was about, as I said, the duplicity on the part of the police. It was about the fact that on the Cape Flats in this war zone, in this land of hard living, nothing is ever as it seems. Who is colluding with whom? Um, the fact that people know exactly who is responsible for the heinous crimes that are committed there but will not come forward because they're terrified because they will be taken out. And it's this climate of mistrust and trauma that we really found ourselves in the middle of. And I think it was just our own sense of trauma, seeing communities being wrenched apart, living in war zones on a daily basis, children not being able to go to school because they might get caught in the crossfire of gang violence, and yet no end in sight. So that was really what it was about. Now, now JP, let me come back to you. What is the extent of the, of the gang violence in Cape Town and, and the growth of gangs in the area? I mean, in the last year, we saw that uh, murder rate, uh, for gang murders specifically in Cape Town, dropped to about 380 murders. Uh, that's 86 less than the year before, so an alarming figure. Uh, three years ago, Cape murders, gang murders in Cape Town made up one-fifth of all the murders in the city, so 20% of the murders. Uh, after two years of the strategy around the stabilization unit and the gang and drug task team, wielding the limited powers the city has access to relative to what national government can wield, uh, we have seen a reduction. It's hard to claim how much of that Cape Town can realistically claim. It's difficult to disentangle cause and effect here. But uh, last year, murder, gang murders made up 11.4% of the, the murders, so just about half the, the number of murders on our gang murders that used to be. Uh, and it's still a, a very, very alarming figure. And the fact remains is that um, Hazel is completely right. The gangsters have long, are able to carry on doing what they do and are not effectively brought to justice. Gangsters hang around for a long time. And we are very excited about the George Thomas uh, Gewalt uh, case that uh, saw him be put away with many of his um, shooters. That's, that was brilliant and kudos to everybody in SAPS and the NPA involved in that. Now we need to see it replicated another 50 times to take out all our other, other heavy hitters. And I'm afraid until we do that, you can't stabilize the suburbs in the Cape Flats enough to run the other projects that would in turn help prevent the resuscitation of that. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. People say, well, you must fight unemployment, you must create jobs, you must do all these other things. But within those communities with the levels of gang violence and gang intimidation as it is, that's very difficult to do. People say the state of housing is a, uh, is a driving factor for it. When the council does upgrades of the council rental stock, the gangsters come and intimidate, beat up and kill the housing contractors who then end up paying protection money to the gangsters and then the city gets embroiled in that whole mess uh, because saps find out about it and don't act on it for six months. Um, and that is, that is a, a, a very, very difficult situation. So the truth is we're going to need to see far more pointed and effective policing investigations against these high flyers, and many of them, more of them put away. When we stabilize the city, then the other extended public works programs, job creation, the violence prevention through urban upgrading that we're doing in suburbs like Hanover Park and Mannenberg, and the uh, Mayor's Urban Regeneration Campaign and other suburbs like Bishop Labour's Bontieville, Atlantis and Ocean View, then have a realistic hope of making some progress. Now, May it I seems... I it, uh, sorry, Hazel, I interrupted you there. No, I, I just did wanted to add something, and I really do also agree that there needs to be much more effective law enforcement and prosecution and conviction. But I think, and your next guest, Don Pinnock, will underscore this. Um, mm -hmm. There is a terrible lack in terms of, of role models in the areas most afflicted by gangsterism, um, mm -hmm. a lack of rituals that enable young people to make the transition from childhood to adulthood. They have to fill that gap, and they fill that gap with ghetto families or gang families who give them a sense of validation and, and of worth. Mm -hmm. The other problem is, yes, when we do convict gangsters and they go to prison and they come out, many of them do come out reformed gangsters. Mm -hmm. 
what happens to them then is they go through another period of what we call liminality where they're just stuck betwixt and between. They don't belong to a gang, they've torn up the credit card, but there is no substantial support system for them to reintegrate properly and be uh, accepted back into mainstream society. M m one of the chief sources of my story is a wonderful friend of mine, Mahadin Benzel, who was the subject of a book called The Number by Johnny Steinberg. He has been crime-free since 2003, after spending most of his adult years in, in prison. He is destitute. He has applied to try and volunteer for, for, for um, uh, community initiatives in Manenberg. Mm -hmm. He has never, ever been accepted by the social structures that would find his input so useful. Every single year, though, in Christmas and, and Easter, he's, he, he raises funds to take Easter eggs to the youth that he once terrorized. People like this who come out of prison and are resolved to be crime-free need much greater support than they are receiving from the city, from social development, mm -hmm. and from, from their communities. So, so you're talking about community integration, but talking about communities, uh, JP, is there enough community support uh, for the projects that, uh, that is being launched in these areas to rid the communities of, uh, of these gangs? Look, just perhaps, just quickly back to what Hazel said, I don't agree with her that the city has to do more for reintegration. Um, offender reintegration is specifically not a local government competency. It's very much national government's work. Mm -hmm. That said, we haven't left it waiting for them to do something about it. Uh, we've, we've engaged the Department of Correctional Services. We've had the first job creation already for offenders, where through the EPWP program we have given employment to people being released on parole so that they don't have to return to a life in crime. And we've just recently met with them about expanding that program quite significantly. So it's something we've taken seriously and we're actually running with, even though there is no realistic way in the Constitution and in terms of the schedule of mandates for the different spheres of government that you could make that local government's job. That is, that is very specifically assigned to national government. No. That said, mm -hmm. in terms of support, I think that we would always want more. Every single public meeting you go to, the police, everybody involved, decry the lack of support from communities, the extent to which communities protect gangsters, those who are benefit from that patronage and the criminal economy that the gangsters have established, cry um, or... or uh, will shield gangsters, will throw stones at the police, will attack police officers. Last night it happened again where police officers were attacked in that manner. SAPS members in this case is very frustrating. Um, but I must say I'm encouraged to see the tip-offs we're getting. Um, when we started our gang and drug task team, we were lucky if we got a handful of tip-offs a month. Now we're getting 25, 28, 30 tip-offs a week. I can sometimes on my phone alone during the day get four tip-offs which I pass on to our gang unit. Many of those are hitting dirt. I had a tip-off from a person about a broken electricity box in Bontieval where he thought the gangsters were storing something in, passed it on to the gang and drug task team. They were there in under 20 minutes. And indeed, that's where we found ammunition and an R4 rifle. Mm -hmm. So many of these tip-offs are spot on and are helping us make a dent to the yeah. extent that we now take more guns right. off the street in five months than we used to do in five years just, before just, that. So an intelligence-driven policing is definitely the answer. Just in closing, now that's the question I wanted to pose to you. Is that the only solution, though? No. I mean, the policing is the one part I'm responsible for, but it is a very small part. You need to do a whole lot more to intercede in, in what is happening in these communities. And Don is spot on. His new book, Gang Town, uh, explains it very well, and he's got a very cogent set of interventions proposed at the back of the, the book uh, around what needs to be done. I have, in fact, arranged for our mayoral committee to get a presentation from him on that and on his recommendations because I think he's spot on with them. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is a lot more we can do. All it right. is going to take much more resources than local government mm -hmm. can muster. Uh, remember, our funding is, is committed. Our funding is committed on the services we deliver. There isn't a great deal of maneuver for, for local government in terms of its spending priorities. Mm -hmm. um, we are there to render the basic services that the Constitution enjoins us to do. Mm -hmm. yes. the, there is going to have to be a much more uh, robust and meaningful contribution from national government on this and a partnership uh, in order to put in place the systems that have to be there to prevent young people from getting into the clutches of this. But mm -hmm. I must tell you, hope is not lost. Don um, introduced us to his book about rituals and rites of passage into adulthood. Uh, we embraced that very firmly. We created the Metro Police Cadet Program, our Metro Police Youth Camps. We've had 1,600 young people on those Metro Police Camps in the last two years 
directly in response to Pinnock's um, suggestions. And our cadets are now 100 in number. The first of them are getting promoted and right. are getting employment themselves in Metro Police. And so we're taking that, those proposals uh, very seriously and looking at the whole of society mm -hmm. interventions, even from a policing perspective. Uh, Hazel, just in closing, uh, what have you found in terms of the documentary that, uh, that you've done? Uh, is there more that can be done, uh, especially not just in Cape Town, but across uh, South Africa? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're seeing the eruption of gangsterism in Port Elizabeth as well. We're seeing it in the rural hinterlands. We're seeing it everywhere. We're seeing it in, in Izamo Yetu. And so much more needs to be done. But I think it all, and I hate to sound trite, but it all really does begin at home. And it's about cultivating and nurturing a generation of youngsters who at the moment don't seem to have any hope in the future of this country, who have role models who are criminals, leadership that is weak um, on, on a national level, uh, corruption that is rife, and that seems to be the way that they think that they can get some kind of validation. For them, crime pays because nothing else does. And it's about getting those youth to start believing in themselves and getting validation for all the right reasons. And then, of course, for those gangsters who have come out of prison, who want to make a difference, but are maybe too too old and, 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 and frail now because they've lived a life, most, they've been career criminals. It's also about supporting them and showing that you actually can change and that second chances are possible. We don't just talk the, we mustn't just talk the talk, we've got to walk the walk with them. Thank you so much to both of you for joining us. Uh, that uh, was uh, uh, Western Cape. Um, uh, that was Hazel Friedman who won the Vodacom Western Cape TV Journalist of the Year in 2013 for her story on special assignment on the Cape Wars called Duplicity, as well as the mayoral committee member, J.P. Smith, in studio. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Pleasure. All right, now after the break, you have to stay tuned. Uh, you heard J.P. Smith there talking about the criminologist and author of the book uh, Gang Town, Don Pinnock. We will be chatting to him uh, shortly after our first break, so you don't want to miss it. Meanwhile, academic activities at WITS will continue today following yesterday's disruptions. Let's take a look at some of the comments. The university is in the process of suspending and barring those responsible for violent protests on the campus where a lecture hall was set alight. You can send it to our Twitter handle at uh, SABC Newsroom. Here are some of them now. Uh, this one from Daniela Renzon. How are non-WITS students uh, accessing campus without student cards? Student safety should be protected, says Daniela Renzon. Let's find out uh, if there's some more. KG says, your prayers, please, as I am going to write uh, hashtag industrial electronics, both students and works, uh, hashtag vits. And uh, this one from uh, Kaya Lishle says, I find it highly perplexing. How does torturing a lecture hall helps in waging a noble fight against free education? It is deplorable says Kaya Shisha Kumalo. And this one from Angelo C. Lowe. Evidently, burning down lecture rooms is the only way to get a response. So what does hashtag Vits expect? Uh, fees must fall, says uh, Angelo. And there you can see a picture there of the building that was set alight yesterday at Vits University. Why do we set our buildings alight? We asked that question to you before. You can remember that. Why would students burn down something, a lecture hall, where they need to return to? Well, I need to find out from you on uh, the Twitter handle at SABC Newsroom. You can also let us know about that. And, of course, the question that we pose, how do we purge our communities from these gangsters and these gang lands? Let me know. Now, let's take a look at the front pages of the newspapers from around the globe. And we start off in Europe. The Times report that uh, David Cameron was dragged into a row over offshore tax avoidance yesterday after his late father's multi-million pound investment fund was revealed to have paid no British tax for 30 years. Moving to New York, the New York International Times says that uh, foreign fighters search team of the experts from the FBI, the State Department and the Department of Homeland Security met with their Belgium counterparts a month before the Brussels terrorist attacks to try to correct the gaps in Belgium's widely criticized ability to track terrorism or terrorist plots. And finally, in China, the South China Morning Post reports that China's former top general who used to run the world's largest army has been charged with uh, taking bribes, totaling 80 million yuan. A source close to the senior military officials told that paper. 
Those are all your newspapers from around the globe. Let's now take a look at uh, what is happening in our courts today. And we start off here in the, uh, there in the Western Cape. The four men accused of the murder of 16-year-old Franziska Blocklinger are today expected to apply for bail in the Weinberg Magistrates Court. Now, they face charges of murder, rape and robbery. The girl was allegedly strangled to death while jogging in the Tokai Forest last month. In Durban, the man charged for killing two joggers last month is expected to appear in court today. Now, those are some of the diary news coming up, but uh, first let's take a break now and we'll be right back uh, with the author of the book uh, Gangtown, Don Pinock. So don't go away. In Africa, technology has created many new ways of doing things. ICT is an increasingly important part of everybody's life. It's being used in education, for social media, and now for farming too. The best thing about internet for a farmer is that we get to share information. On Network, we give you all the important African technology and social media news. That's Network with Ms. Pomele Lezondi every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. Central African Time, only on SABC News. Tonight in an SABC exclusive news expose, uh, we show you how firearm proficiency certificates are fraudulently sold for a few thousand rand. What you did was illegal. Do you at least acknowledge that? What you did is illegal. I, I say it, it, it could be probably illegal. Nigeria is Africa's second largest martyr producer. The chief executive of Enrisco says he started the company with a capital of 75 million US dollars. The problem now is that the market has been created in China. He says that doing business in the country is becoming more difficult every day. We continue our discussion today, and of course, you know the question that we pose to you. We're talking about gangs and gang violence and ganglands, and we're asking you that question. How do we rid our communities uh, from gangs and gangsterism? I would like to get your thoughts on the Facebook page. Let's see if we can pick up the question there uh, on the screen so you can get it for us. Uh, how do we rid our communities? So how do we purge our communities from these gangs? You can let us know on the Facebook page uh, as well as on the Twitter handle at SABC Newsroom. It seems like we haven't got the question right now. But it is there, so you can let us know what's on your mind. Now, Cape Town is considered one of the most beautiful destinations in the world. But according to the latest report from the Mexican Council for Public Security and Criminal Justice shows that Cape Town is also among the top ten most violent cities in the world. And highlighting this in the rise in gangsterism. Now, according to criminologist and author of Gang Town, Don Pinnock, Cape Town doesn't have a gang problem so much as a youth problem and gangs are one of the outcomes but to tell us more is uh, joining us uh, from our seapoint studios don pinocco very good morning to you don and welcome good morning elvis first and foremostly tell us why did you decide to write this book well i've been working on gangs for about 30 years and um i'm fascinated in behavior i've uh, i really interested in why people do things and gangs like love and war are extreme examples of behavior but I, this particular book was really because um, I think we need a solution we have talked about eliminating gangs purging gangs um, and from my from my studies and from my research and my working with gangs that's really only a very small part of the problem we've got to solve the youth problem and in fact the youth problem in this country it's a violation of their constitutional rights. Their Cape Town alone has something like 200,000 young people without jobs, uh, not in school, not in training. What are they doing? They're in the streets, and they have to make some sort of a living, and then they get into gangs, and we, uh, you know, then they're the problem. Mm -hmm. But the, re the real issue is we've got to work out how we 
get young people involved in a life that is not uh, going to put them in gangs in the first place. Mm -hmm. Now that, that is really the yes. big issue. Now, now why is it so difficult for youngsters uh, when they do become gangsters it's it's very hard for them to get out of those gangs. Why? Well look they see things in gangs um, and the they they do things to other gangs that that is uh, you know violation of their rights it's it, they kill people they they beat up people and if they leave the gang uh, they don't have the protection of the gang the gang is a family the gang is an extended space in which they feel safe in highly uh, risky environments mm -hmm. so uh, you know getting out a gang is is pretty tough stuff mm -hmm. and and, and joining them because people sometimes don't understand the concept of a gang. What in your book relates to the explanation or the concept of a gang? <laughs> you know, uh, the more I looked, the more uh, simple it became. A gang is simply a group of people with the same purpose that meet for a particular reason over time. Now a gang, it doesn't have to be criminal, but if it is criminal, that purpose is crime. There are many kinds of gangs in this city. There are warrior gangs that are kids who are just be, uh, you know, cutting it, each other up with, with pangas. There are merchant gangs that are the classic drug gangs. These are the guys who buy and sell uh, in the marketplace. There are the syndicates above those who are, are organizing those, those young people. Then you get international syndicates that move uh, mainly drugs uh, through, through the city. And then, according to my definition of the gang, you get people in corporations who are conspiring to money launder. They're a gang. You get people in government uh, offices that, that conspire to steal public funds. They are a gang as well. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so the concept of gang is very broad, but the real core issue of gangs, for me, is not those bigger syndicates. It's why most of the gangs are actually teenagers. Mm -hmm. And we have to try and solve the teenage problem. We have to work out what that is. And if you look at that, what is it? It's not rocket science. It's that we have an absence of fathers. Um, we have uh, one in three kids have been brought up without a father. And a young man without a father has a, has a, a sadness in him. And a, uh, he feels it's his fault. And he has an anger and a shame that builds up as, as he becomes a teenager. You have mothers who are that they don't have enough food, maybe they're drinking, maybe they're hyper-stressed. This has an impact on their fetus. And the kids come out, they, they, they're constructed to fight um, almost at that level. It's, it's an extraordinary way in which we actually discovered that we, we build children. Mm -hmm. And then you have a schooling system which is boring. Kids are terribly bored at school. I don't think we're teaching the right things. Half the kids that start school bail out before the end of it. Mm -hmm. um, they, they, they see people with matric that don't have jobs. They can't figure out why they should stay in school. Because schooling in this country is neck up schooling. It's not body schooling. It's not hands. It's not skill schooling. I think we, re you know, we have to have reading, writing, and, and, and uh, arithmetic. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, the kids that are starting school now are going to retire in 2065 to 2070. Those skills that they're learning now are probably, we don't know what skills they're going to need, but there's two skills they need, a love of learning and an ability to use their bodies and, and physically actually construct the world. So education is a big issue around the gang because the kids not at school are in the streets and they're causing trouble. So if those are some of the issues uh, linked to social ills as well within the community, what are then some of the realistic solutions that, uh, that, that you have in your book? Yeah, it was a really controversial solution. Apart from looking after pregnant mothers, helping fathers to fix the schooling, there are a number of other issues. But one of them has to be to decriminal, decriminalize drugs. Um, and I know that's, that's shock horror. We can't possibly let drugs be around. But the war on drugs has failed. And um, the people are using more and more drugs. And the reason is that the, the dealers, it's their job and their passion to addict people. Because once they've addicted people, they've got them. If we decriminalize drugs, we collapse the gangs because they operate around territory to protect drug turfs. We collapse the, the syndicates. We collapse the international structures. And we can deal with drugs in the way that we deal with alcohol and tobacco. Um, Portugal did it. Drug use went down rapidly. Other countries in South America are decriminalizing drugs. And drugs cause so much trouble. In, in, they, they lock up the police in the process of uh, chasing drug 
uh, related crimes. They, they clog up the courts, they clog up the prisons, and there's still drugs in prisons. And then everybody gets back in the streets after prison, and they get into the drug trade again. So decriminalizing drugs is one of those. I have a, you know, a long list in the book that we can't go into now. But, but uh, helping families to be real families, getting schooling to be exciting for kids that they stay on and really want to learn, and decriminalizing drugs are, are three key issues. We've also got to, um, uh, JP's uh, you know, quite right, we, we have to keep up the pressure at the policing level. They are people who are getting kids involved in gangs. So the police have to keep going, but you can't expect the police to solve the gang problem. Mm -hmm. It's too big. The police are a thin blue line in a whole history of problems that young people are going through. And you can't just clobber the kids because that is, that's only the end of the line. Uh, we've got to solve the earlier stuff as well. Uh, Don, I must tell you, it sounds very interesting, and I think there's a lot more to talk about this, and we'll have a follow-up discussion with you on this particular one. But lastly and very briefly, what is the message that you are hoping that people would take from your book? First of all, I really want this to be folded into policy. Um, I mean, that's why I wrote it. Policy is the most important way to go, because that's when s government actually does something about it. And it's very gratifying that J.P. Smith is... Uh, you know, has been using my stuff as and pulling me into the process. I'm, I'm very happy to cooperate there. The other thing is that if we build programs for kids, they like what gangs give them. If we want to work with gang kids, we have to build programs that look like gangs but take them to another place. We do that at Chrysalis Academy, which I'm linked to, uh, with the Yasiko program. We take kids into the wilderness. We go through processes with them. And it is amazing, even the toughest kids, you take them into a place where you really ask them who they are, help them through, put them through processes where trust happens, they change. We can do this, it is possible, it's not rocket science, we just have to put all the steps in place and we can change the gang situation. Don, thank you so much for your time once again. Pleasure. That was Don Pinnock, criminologist and author of the book Gang Town unbelievable stuff. We'll definitely do a follow-up with Don on his book itself to take a look at the factors there because I believe there's some suggestions and solutions there. You've heard J.P. Smith touch on those, that they've taken, uh, taken some of uh, the, the comments from the book and some of the solutions from the book and implementing those in the city of Cape Town and maybe we should take a leaf out of that book. Well, there's a question for you as well that we pose to you. Hopefully it's on your screen right now. And the question that we pose to you, what else can be done to purge and rid our communities of these gangs and gang violence as well as gangsterism all linked into one? I want to know your thoughts on the Facebook page as well as on the Twitter handle at SABC Newsroom. Now let's take a look at some of your comments uh, from far and wide. The Democratic Alliance has written to the Speaker of the Johannesburg Metro, Constance Bapella, requesting an urgent special council meeting to discuss the pick it up strike. Let's take a look at some of your comments. Uh, remember, you can send them to at SABC Newsroom. This one from Kelly uh, says, how does the uh, fourth, Ave how does fourth Avenue in Linden get back on pick it up route? Other parts of Linden get collected, but we haven't uh, for two weeks, says uh, Kelly. Uh, that's uh, at City of Johannesburg. The Neo says, the B613 unit of Pick It Up is doing the most at the oddest hours. They do it late at night. I believe my bin was picked up at around about 12 o'clock last night. Johnny C. McConnell says, Pick It Up are holding us citizens at ran ransom. It must probably be here. Thrashing the streets and pavements, posing health risk. Same people hounding us in December the 4th. Christmas box, yes, they come around and knock on your door and make a noise outside and tell you to give them some Christmas box. Don't you hear that every Christmas, but then they don't pick up your bin for a month. And then what? This one from Tyler says, I've decided to recycle, and then Tyler vanished. He recycled himself there. Vusumzi says, maybe there's no street kid violence. Feast must fall, nor pick it up strike there in Panama, says uh, Vusumzi. Calm, Jamla. In fact, uh, there's one that we missed there. Let's see if we can. No, in fact, that one is gone. Those are all the uh, comments that we have thus far. We'll take a look at some more of them a little bit later. Now, let's take a look at our Facebook page. And uh, let's find that here and see if we can have it on our screen here behind us. It seems like the, the African National Congress believes that uh, there's no basis 
for the Democratic Alliance's uh, motion to remove President Jacob Zuma from uh, office uh, today. Remember that debate is happening today and we'll take a look at that. If you can see that there's the president on screen there and uh, they say there's no motion, the ANC that is uh, for the DA to do that. Then we move on to the United Nations. The UN has confirmed fresh allegations of rape against its peacekeepers in the Democratic Republic of Congo. The organization has been in the spotlight for months following allegations of sexual abuse by its blue helmets mainly in the Central African Republic that now total more than 100. And finally, fuel prices. If you are not ready for this one, you are going to miss out. Today is your last day. Fuel prices are expected to rise by a large margin at midnight tonight, with the petrol price increasing by 88 cents a litre, diesel by 97 cents and paraffin by 76 cents a litre. Now, for all these details and news, you can go to our Facebook page. Uh, just search for Newsroom and you can find all these details on your Facebook page. Go to your nearest garage today if you don't want to miss out because you're going to pay 88 cents more as from midnight tonight. But let's now take a break. We'll be right back after the break. Stay tuned. Children's rights and health are a priority in the journey of good health. All children uh, should have uh, access to adequate health care, right. not only curative but preventative as well. How to identify ADHD on children. ADHD is a childhood disorder which manifests with the symptoms of hyperactivity, impulsivity, and or inattention. Is breastfeeding still a vital nutrition to babies even today? Breastfeeding for the first six months of life is absolutely crucial. Catch Health Talk with Dr. Selom Mutawun every Saturday from 9 till 10 a.m. We continue our theme on gangsterism and ganglands today. Gangsterism has plagued the northern areas in Port Elizabeth in the Eastern Cape for decades. Now, community leaders there say almost 50 gangs, uh, gang-related deaths have occurred in these areas just this year alone. But they have not given up on efforts to rehabilitate some affected gang members and youngsters. Now, more than 120 people have died in uh, the gang-related violence thus far. Let's take a look at uh, the story. Earlier this year, a multidisciplinary task team consisting of detectives, crime intelligence, tactical response team and Hawks members was formed to curb violence in this area. More than 250 people have died in gang violence in the past two years. Community members have often fell victim and continuously fear for their lives. And if, if you stay in hell and you're in this place, you, you are living in danger because it's shooting any time of the day, every time of the day. You can go to church, you can go to school. To the gangs out there, I have small kids outside. Please, guys, stop the gang violence. Since the launch of Operation Lockdown in this area, it is said there is some calm restored in the community. There's been a measure of, you know, normalcy kind of returning. But you must remember what's normal um, is not an end to gang violence. We've had a challenge of gang violence since the 60s. So normalcy means that there's less killings. I mean, the, the last time we had a gang killing here was, what, three days ago. Social ills and lack of resources and disadvantaged backgrounds have been identified as a reason that some of these young men and women fall into the trap of gangster lives. 
become so marginalized that we, we feel like a non-entity. And hence our young men killing each other out there. Life has so little value because life has so little value in our community. Um, and, and that's our challenge. How do we tell people, no man, don't give up, continue hoping when y you've got a lack of access to tertiary education, a lack of access to employment, a lack of access to opportunities to improve yourself. So in the end, what happens? Our kids hustle, our young people do what comes easy. Community leaders say law enforcement is one leg that deals with the issue of gangsterism. But much more needs to be done to rehabilitate an entire community that has been affected and infected by gang-related violence. Ivi Weboti, SABC News, Port Elizabeth. And more than 120 people have died in gang violence in the northern areas of Port Elizabeth in the past two years. In 2004, there were 17 different gangs operating in the northern areas, of which eight had ties in operations in Helendale, uh, Helen Vale rather, and in the Galvandale areas. Last month, the police minister, you've seen him there in the picture just a moment ago, Nati Nklerko, returned to the northern areas to assess the progress on the fight against gang activities and hence the launch of Operation Lockdown. Now, Justin Oliphant is a social activist and a community leader in Port Elizabeth in the northern areas, and he joins us now on the line. In fact, in our studios there. Justin, a very good morning to you and welcome. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Thank you for being very patient. It's a long discussion on gangs today, so it took <laughs> some time to get to you. First and foremost, Operation Lockdown, to what extent uh, has it helped to curb the gang violence in the northern areas in Port Elizabeth? Uh, I would say that, that in terms of, you know, uh, crime prevention, uh, in terms of the intervention from SAPS, there's, there's been a measure of success. Um, li like I mentioned, that normalcy has, you know, started returning to the community again. Uh, the challenges, are, however, which we have is the gang problem has been so ingrained within the community for more than 50 years now already that when, when we look at police intervention... Um, we've become accustomed, you know, to, to the cycle that every, every two, three years we've got gang wars, then we've got, you know, major interventions, then it dies down and then it resurfaces. And, and it's kind of like a, a cyclical repetition constantly. Mm. But do you feel there's an urgency to fight gangsterism in the area, especially in the, in the northern areas? Because the minister was there. Did it, did it make any difference there? Um, oh, difficult question. Uh, specifically in terms of the fact that many of us believe that, that there's no real political will to address this challenge. When you consider that the first record of organized gangs in the northern areas of, of, of Nelson Mandela Bay goes back as far as 1963. Um, I think the first gang back then recorded was the Panga Boys up until 2016 where we have in an area like Galvandale, Helenvale, where we've got about, you know, 12 to 16 or more gangs fighting for that territory, um, over 25 gangs within the northern areas fighting for control. So in terms of leadership and in terms of intervention, in terms of, of, of you know, concerted efforts uh, being, being put in place, I, I would say that if nothing could have been achieved since 1963, then any efforts that are, you know, taking place now um, will be futile without a multi-sectoral approach. I hear this thing of multidisciplinary approach, you know, but it's all about combating crime. It's all about vilifying the young people in our community, making bad guys, you know, out of out of the the kids, and 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 profiling our people as as being gangs and gangsters and stereotyping us. Mm -hmm. It's going to need a whole lot more than just policing uh, the you know the challenge. That multi-sectoral approach that you're talking about, does that include the community and to what extent is the community involved in fighting this scourge? Elvis, if, if we look at, at, at the approach of, of leadership, very often it, it, it tends to have this pseudo-innocent you know, appearance, almost as if we are trying to wish away the real issues. Um, I, I often mention the fact that maybe the right questions are not being answered. Mm -hmm. Maybe we're not looking, you know, at, at the real core issues. 
And yes, of course, the community will have to be included in a multi-sectoral approach, but we will also have to include, you know, um, uh, correctional services. We will also have to include all other government departments, including uh, education, in including welfare. We, we will need to make sure that every single leg of the pot, you know, will be balanced properly in order for us to win this war. Mm -hmm. When I consider th challenges like, you know, lack of access for young people, challenges like uh, the living conditions of our people, challenges like our people having become accustomed, you know, and, and to an extent desensitized to the violence which we find ourselves in, the, the, the mass occur occur occurrence of, of PTSD within our community, it, it, it tells me that maybe they haven't really sat down and done homework and really looked at what affects us. Um, it's commendable that the minister, you know, Minister Ntleko comes to walk in our community. Um, maybe not, you know, as commendable that he comes to walk the same streets which we have to live on, the same challenges which we have to face, you know, with a bunch of bodyguards. Um, maybe not as commendable that he comes to our community um, trying to, you know, trying to fit in uh, with the little floppy hat and the sneakers and... Uh, we, we don't need, you know, parading. We don't, we don't need the appearance of, you know, I understand what you're going through. We need, you know, concrete interventions. We need challenges which the community lives with. We need that to be addressed concretely. Now, um, like Helen Vale, for, for instance. Helen Vale is a community which was supposed to be a temporary settlement to address the challenges of housing during the forced removals era. And now, 50 years later, we still have the Helen Vale Challenge, except now a community which was supposed to house 9,000 people house over 35,000 people. The challenge we have now with housing, specifically in the Helen Vale area, mm -hmm. we hear now promise of about 2,500 houses being built. Yeah. My question is, who's going to have to sit and watch? Yeah. You know, who's going to get houses? Who's mm -hmm. going to sit back you know, and, and, and think, oh, they, they didn't give me mm -hmm. anything? Justin. We need to go back to the drawing board yes. and we need to address the real challenges. And that is the community is sitting on the ash heap without hope. Justin, thank you so much for your time. Unfortunately, there's a lot more to discuss here as well, but we've run out of time. Thank you so much for your time. That was Justin Oliphant, uh, Oliphant a social activist and community leader in Port Elizabeth in the northern areas. Now, what a discussion. I hope that you join in that discussion on the fourth Facebook page as well as on the Twitter handle. But we get to say bye for now. We'll be back at the top of our hour in three minutes. Stay tuned. Today keeps you informed with news locally and around the world. When Judge John Thorpe um, challenged, the, challenged the Supreme Court of Appeal when it sent the matter back and said that there must be an inquiry set up. We unpack business news. There's, a, there's an increase in general inflation in the country. We give you up-to-date news of the day. The drugs were seized at several locations in Sydney, including a shipping container sent from Hong Kong. Police saying it's their largest haul of illicit drugs in two years. We round up sports news. Kutata, tell me about the legacy that you would like to build and be remembered for. Trying to get my foundation running, which is going to focus uh, on, you know, all the sport doesn't matter, disability or able body. So, I mean, I'm passionate about sports. Stay informed every Monday to Friday from 3 to 5.30 p.m. CAT. SABC News. The deepening hunger crisis in Malawi is threatening the survival of children and also it is the life-threatening part of malnutrition. Malawi is facing its worst food crisis in nine years. Mugabe is the world's oldest sitting head of state ahead of Queen Elizabeth of Britain. The veteran leader seeks to temporarily forget his party's problems and instead focus on his legacy. But he shows no sign of slowing down or stepping down from power after 36 years in office.
It's Tuesday, the 5th of April, 2016. It is 10 o'clock. This is Newsroom on SABC News, Channel 404. You've just joined us, Jumbo Africa. And a very warm welcome to the second hour. We're broadcasting live from Auckland Park here in Johannesburg, South Africa, to the rest of the African continent. I'm Elvis Preston. And I'm Renee Vest. And we will be with you until 12 o'clock. We're also streaming live on YouTube with the entire show available on our YouTube channel. We're talking about gangs today and we're asking you what else can be done to rid our communities um, uh, from these gangs or gangsterism or gang lands. How do we deal with it? Twitter handle at SABC Newsroom also on our Facebook page. But first, let's take a look at uh, your news headlines. Opposition parties in Parliament to push for a secret ballot in their bid to remove the President, Jacob Zuma, from office. Authorities, including the South African Revenue Services, take a look at local companies and citizens implicated in the so-called Panama Papers. And, well, Kenya's Deputy President William Ruto finds out his fate later today as the ICC decides on whether to strike his case off the court roll. Now those are all your headlines, but before we get to the news, let's find out from Kendall Makamate what's happening on the sports front. A very good morning. Good morning to the both of you. It's good to be back here, as well as a hearty good morning to our viewers at home as well. This is what we've got for you in the sports today. The last spot for the Nidbank Cup, last 16, will get decided in the Swanee Derby between Super Sport United and the University of Pretoria tonight. And staying with football, Barcelona and Atletico Madrid face off in the business end of the UEFA Champions League. This as the FIFA Ethics Committee investigates one of its own members, that's Juan Pedro Damiani. That's what we have for you in a little while, at about 10, 20 or so. Back to the main desk for the news. Thank you, Kendall, and let's hear it from Renee on the news. 20 people have been injured after two taxis collided on the R114 in Dipslert, north of Johannesburg. Paramedics say some of the passengers were thrown out of the vehicle. For more, for more on the story, we are joined on the line by ER24 spokesperson Russell Merring. Good morning, Russell. Good morning. Firstly, can you tell us about the current situation of those injured? How, how are they doing and, and are there any fatalities? Uh, fortunately, no fatalities were reported on the scene. Um, a number of the patients uh, were seriously injured, um, but um, they were, in, uh, for example, fractures and dislocations of, of their limbs. Mm -hmm. and, and have you been able to determine the cause of the accident yet? Um, witnesses on scene said um, that one of the taxis had turned off from a small side road and the second taxi failed to notice this and this is when uh, the two uh, taxis collided, one being T-boned. And in terms of road closures, are there any road closures due to the accident and is traffic piling up at all? The traffic uh, was heavily affected in that area and local authorities had to close one lane of the road to allow our emergency workers uh, to work safely. Traffic um, is still affected in that area, but the road is fully open now. All right. Thank you very much, Russell. We will be contacting you later for a further update. That, of course, was ER24 spokesperson Russell Mehring. We will keep you updated on that incident. Now, some opposition parties in Parliament are expected to push for a secret ballot today during the National Assembly motion to remove President Jacob Zuma from office. Meanwhile, the ANC's National Working Committee met at an undisclosed venue in Cape Town yesterday to consider last week's Constitutional Court ruling. The Democratic Alliance, who called for the motion, says the matter transcends party politics and affects all South Africans. It's not the DA's first attempt to remove the president, but this time the party says it's backed by a court. Last week, the Constitutional Court ordered the President to pay for non-security upgrades at his Nkandla residence, as instructed by the Public Protector. For the very first time since the 1994 election, we have the highest court in the land, the Constitutional Court, that has now found that the President conclusively 
violated uh, the Constitution, violated his oath of office, and did not behave in a lawful manner. And that is a very clear trigger of Section 89 of the Constitution. There is no other time when it has been more important than now, because the Constitutional Court declared that President Zuma violated the Constitution, and to that extent, uh, he must be removed, and the perfect body to do so is Parliament. You must exhaust that avenue uh, if there is to be something beyond Parliament that can be done. The Freedom Front Plus calls it a historic event. Last time they did not listen to reason, they listened to their party caucus and their party decisions and the Constitutional Court found that decision of them to be unconstitutional. We hope that common sense will prevail. We, are, we really appeal to all ANC members to vote in terms of their conscience. They've all uh, was responsible and, and, and they all know what needs to be done. No member of a political party uh, or no member of any political party since 1994 has ever voted differently from the party line. Even those uh, opposition parties, they will be voting in accordance with their party line. Why will they expect differently from the ANC? That is uh, just sheer uh, hypocrisy. The IFP says it's still deciding which route to take, while the UDM wouldn't divulge its plans. Abra Barbia, SABC News. Parliament. We have the price of fuel will go up tonight at midnight with petrol increasing by between 86 and 88 cents a litre and diesel by between 96 and 98 cents a litre. Paraffin users will also be hard hit having to pay an extra 76 cents per litre. There is no electricity at this informal settlement. Residents use paraffin to cook light up their homes at night and heat water for bathing. Anita Badula sells paraffin at this puzzle shop, among other daily necessities. She's concerned about the increasing prices. She says business is already slow. Business is too slow. I just keep selling because I'm used to this. I get stock from the Chinese for about 200 rand. In a week, I only sell 120 liter jerry can. Doris Matebula sells cooked lunches to workers at nearby factories. She has had to start using wood to cook as she says paraffin is expensive. She says she now uses paraffin only for household purposes. Matebula is calling on government to intervene to try and bring down the price of paraffin. Gloria Stefago Musi, SABC News, Johannesburg. TUT's two Shoshanguva campuses north and south are reopening today. Now, safety and security is expected to be tight at the campuses. The campuses were shut down on the 4th of March following violent protests which disrupted the registration process. Now, students will be expected to provide proof of the academic registration at the entrance and also have to provide proof of identity. University spokesperson Villa de Reiter now joins us on the line for an update. Villa, a very good morning to you and welcome. Good morning, thank you. Have the two campuses open already? Yes, um, students have been coming to the campuses in a steady stream. We have been increased, uh, increasing the security at those campuses. And like you said earlier, they have to have a copy of their ID document together with proof of registration or the student cards. Students who haven't managed to register before um, we close those campuses will be given an opportunity to do so. We will deal with all those cases this week. Mm -hmm. Has the management resolved the outstanding issues with, which led to the closure of the campuses in the first place? Yes, there's a lot of work that has been done um, during the break. One of the issues has been about uh, financial problems that students experience. What we have done, we already started with a campaign in November. We had a signing of agreements of debt that students could um, enter into with the institution. And I think to a large extent we have now resolved those issues and students will be able to register. We do not um, deny students to register because of financial problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do not offer free education because it's against the Higher Education Act, but we assist students to sign the agreement of debt to enable them to register. Now, Villa, what measures have been put in place to avoid another shutdown, and are you confident that this will hold? We will be monitoring the situation very clo closely, and there is a court interdict in place on, at TUT, and it's, it's applicable to those campuses as well. We will identify people who cause trouble and we will deal with them. The South African police is also assisting us. 
to identify people who make trouble. And if they transgress the laws, they will be dealt with by the police. If they transgress our rules, we will deal with them. We also had a meeting with parents on the 29th of March to get them involved. And there, there were just over 500 parents who attended that meeting. Um, following that meeting, a parent forum was established where parents will now also engage with the institution on a regular basis to assist us in resolving issues and um, to, to uh, address issues that their children may have. Now, I indicated in my introduction that safety and security will be tight. Uh, how tight is that security measures? Well, no one will gain access to the campus without proof of an ID or um, the student card or proof of um, registration. If they don't have those documents, they will unfortunately not be allowed on campus and we will check every individual entering the campus. But those uh, that have to show proof of uh, registration, if they haven't registered, how will they show that? Um, well, they, they have documentation, they receive documentation from the institution that they've been accepted for courses, so they need to bring those letters along together with their ID um, and then we will assist them to go and register. Mm. And just a small group of mm. students, it's about 50 odd students who haven't registered yet. I see. Now, Villa, any measures in place to make up for the lost time that the students uh, have lost during this period? Yes, we will still be able to catch up on the time loss. The academic uh, program will now run until July for students to be able to catch up in, on classes and um, the exams will probably start towards the end of June, beginning of July. But there, there will be enough time for them to catch up. We have worked very hard to put the new academic program together. Villa, thank you so much for your time and joining us on Newsroom. Thank you. That was Villa de Reiter. Uh, she is, of course, a spokesperson uh, for TUT. Right now, as the Pick It Up illegal strike continues its into its fifth week, the National Institute for Communicable Diseases has called for an urgent intervention. People are increasingly exposed to health risks, especially in informal settlements. At the best of times, Alex can be a difficult place to live in overpopulated and depressed. When ravish is not removed for weeks on end, it becomes almost uninhabitable. Our children come and play here. Once they're done playing, they're holding the rubbish, the germs, and then they go eat indoors. The smell is so overwhelming that I could feel it when I'm asleep. It's too much to bear. We struggle to sleep. Flies and rats the biggest problem now. Flies can transmit germs mechanically on their legs, so that's one issue. Um, people handling the rubbish or playing in it, as children might do, uh, might be exposed to, to various uh, pathogens. A number of risks from rodents. They uh, can attack people, they can bite them. They can transmit infections either directly by their bites or from their excretions. An appeal by the Houghton Health Department. Yes, we understand the workers' issues that are very central. It's about their well-being and we'll never downplay those issues. But also the workers must be, have a full understanding of the impl impact and the implications of the uncollected rubbish over such a prolonged period of time. As incidents of intimidation continue, pick it up workers aren't budging. We are still saying, as the employees of pick it up, We'll go back to work, provided the employers give, the employer give us money. Negotiations have deadlocked. The city has established a joint operations center to identify hot spots for agent attention. Mahiketa Matabe, SABC News, Alexandra. Gauteng Health MEC Kadani Maglandu says the pick it up strike should be urgently resolved to prevent health hazards proposed by uncollected waste. The problem has also resulted in the increase of the rodent manifestation. She spoke to SABC News earlier this morning and was asked if there are any contingency plans to collect the piling garbage.
The city has uh, put up a comprehensive plan uh, headed by the d disaster, the EMS team, uh, with Pick It Up and, and all of that. They've mobilized uh, uh, private sector companies to come on board. What the Department of Health is doing is to support from an environmental health point, point of view, as well as our infectious um, um, outbreak response team to go into those areas and ensure that areas where there's a pileup of debt, those after they've been clean, uh, the environmental health look into those and to ensure that indeed they there is no any other um, a, 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 a problem that can be picked up later. And I think of importance here is the highly dense uh, populated areas like the townships, as well as the uh, informal settlements in the main, your Deep Slope, Ivory Park, as well as Alexandra. Those we need to pay attention to those, and the plans of the city include those kind of areas as well. Yeah. Let's turn our attention now to the health risks associated here. I mean, when you read some of the articles that are out and talking about the health risks associated with this piling up of rubbish, I mean, some of those things we can talk about um, hepatitis, polio excreted from human feces, and obviously mm. little babies' nappies that are just lying mm. in the rubbish. I mean, that's, that's the reality of what it's like. Um, you've got um, diarrhea, gastroenteritis, you've got, uh, I, I mean, the list just goes on. There's about a hundred different viruses that you can possibly get from this rubbish that's piling up in our streets. Have there been any cases as you, that you know of that have been admitted into hospitals? There has not been any human cases reported as, as far. That's why Leanne, uh, our outbreak response team working with the city and the environmental inspectors, it's really to eliminate those. But our hospitals are on the alert uh, to look into this matter because, uh, yes, indeed, this matter was brought to our attention as a result of a rodent which would have been picked up in one of the sites, particularly in Ivory Park in an era called Maibuye, and it was sent to the NICD for testing and indeed it had tested pos positive for previous uh, a pneumonic plague and therefore uh, we then started getting worried that uh, if indeed this is has happened in one area there's a possibility of it spreading around hence we've decided to go out on a massive communications we worked tirelessly Friday up until very late to look into what is that we must do uh, to make communities aware also to have public meetings in those areas and but also to appeal to communities that uh, where people can they must take their rubbish into the nearest dumping site and I'm told including as I entered here SAPC that some of the parking of the dumping sites are full are and therefore we full. need to make sure that that information is conveyed to the city and they are cleared as soon as possible but over and above that uh, where people cannot take these things with that dumping site they must be collected as soon as possible uh, of importance these diseases can be prevented and that's why um, uh, rolling out the program of going out to communities is to really make people aware and to make sure that at least there's availability of water as, as, as quick as possible because these are waterborne disease and you can prevent them uh, as soon as possible if you uh, have the right interventions in place. And most importantly, I mean, I do know that we were chatting about it off air. I mean, you look at a, an area like Dipslow that mm. is, is almost, uh, it's, uh, I'm going to over-exaggerate a bit by saying it's almost buried in rubbish, but I mean, that's in certain areas, I can imagine the, 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 the piles of rubbish everywhere and the kids play there. And that's the problem, is that these little children, they don't know, they're busy playing in these rubbish dumps. And I mean, they are the most vulnerable. They can get exceptionally sick. So again, it's to educate parents to keep their kids away from Absolutely. this rubbish and wash your hands. And they wash their hands, but also the important, the, the difficulty about this situation is that schools are on, uh, on recess now and kids have ample time and to be playing around. Therefore, uh, our coaches and empowering communities to understand what is going on is very important. And also to make sure that the rubbish is collected in those areas. And I think of importance and the priority now is to make sure that rubbish is collected as soon as possible. Because as I said, we can prevent these diseases from happening if indeed we, we implement the right measures, put the right measures in place and collect that. And people must also make sure that their rubbish is dumped at the right place at the right time. So where sites are full, the city must make sure that those interventions um, are escalated and they, they're implemented as agently. A livestock auctioneer is in trouble for disposing of a herd of cattle belonging to a community of Dilokwaneng outside Brits in the northwest. It is alleged that the auctioneer intercepted the planned sale of the cattle from a group of alleged livestock thieves and promised to hand the animals back to the community. However, after a long time of giving people the runaround, it was discovered the cattle have been sold without the knowledge of the owners. 
The community received the livestock and a vast portion of the land consisting of a game farm from the government as part of the victorious land claims process a few years ago. Liquidators, the Financial Services Board and the South African Revenue Services are now taking a hard look at South African companies and citizens implicated in the so-called Panama Papers League. Among them are investment company Fidentia and President Jacob Zuma's nephew Kulubusu Zuma. The documents show that at least two of the men involved in the Fidentia fraud used the firm to create offshore companies. An estimated 1.2 billion rand was misappropriated in the Fidentia scandal. More, on, more than 60,000 people, including widows and orphans of mine workers who were beneficiaries of the Fidentia controlled trust, were affected. The leaked documents purport to show that Kulubuse Zuma was allegedly authorized to represent Capricat Limited, one of two offshore companies that acquired oil fields in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2010. But Zuma's spokesperson, Vuyum Kize, says Zuma had never owned an offshore bank account or used one to move finances. This revelation comes as liquidators attempt to recover losses from a 2009 mining deal involving Zuma's Aurora Empowerment System. Our eyes are the window to the beautiful wonders of the world, but blindness enhances other senses. Technology has made living with blindness easy. If you look in the side here, yeah, it's got like grooves in there. Yeah. So the first one after when it comes together will be 20 rand, 50 rand. And if I slide this in, I can see according to the grooves, it's now on, on 50 rand. To Steve Kekana, blindness was never a hindrance, but a blessing. You've got to know that you, you are the child of the universe, being blind, and you've got the right to be here. Join your host, Dr. Silo Mutawun, every Saturday from 9 a.m. Preparing for victory requires intense effort, intense effort. and teamwork. When you get to it, there is no turning back because all eyes are on you. When it's action time, nothing should stand in your way. Sports Life tackles and analyzes all the sport action. This is the home of all your sport news, updates, and more. Sports Life, weekdays at 8.30 p.m. Welcome back. My name is Kendall Makamati and I've got your sports on Newsroom. Our top story for this bulletin is about football, where midfielder Kamuhela Mukocho has announced his retirement from international football. He says he will not be available for call-ups, that is, until circumstances change. Mukocho has been at loggerheads with Sheikh Mashaba, the coach, who he accused of never really giving him a chance in the Bafana Bafana squad. He's used his Instagram account to announce how upset he is at not being given opportunities. Mashab has previously said that he looked sluggish, which angered Mukocho, who plays for FC Twente in the Dutch Eredivisie. Now, the last spot in the Nedbank Cup quarterfinals will be decided tonight with a Tswani derby between Supersport United and the University of Pretoria. Through to the next round are Bidvest Vets, Bumalanga Black Aces, Polokwane City, Mamilodi Sundance, Free State Stars, Orlando Pirates, and Baroka FC. This match takes place at the Lucas Muripe Stadium at 7.30 p.m. tonight. Now, the United coach Stuart Baxter and his charges were the eventual winners in the Gauteng Champion of Champions tournament and competed with Mamilodi Sundowns' Jomo Cosmos, which kept them busy during the international break, while Ducks can shift focus from the ongoing relegation battle in the PSL. 
staying with football, a member of the ethics committee responsible for rooting out uh, corruption in soccer's governing body, FIFA, has himself been placed under a preliminary investigation. Now, Juan Pedro Damiani is being investigated over a possible business relationship with fellow Uruguayan Eugenio Figueredo, one of the soccer officials arrested in Zurich last year. The committee's chief judge, Hans Joachim Eckert, had recently become aware of the relationship between Damiani and Figueredo, who is a former head of the South American Football Confederation. The committee statement came after media reports said that possible links between the two had been revealed by documents among the so-called Panama Papers, a huge leak of data by the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists that were based on files from Panama-based law firm Mossack Fonseca. I'll also have you know that, uh, incidentally, Lionel Messi has also been implicated amongst those 11.5 million documents. Now, uh, defending champions Barcelona are eager to bounce back against rivals Atletico Madrid in a Champions League quarterfinal first leg clash at the Nou Camp tonight. This after their El Clasico loss to Real Madrid on Saturday ended their unbeaten 39-match run. In tonight's other match, we've got Bayern Munich hosting Benfica at the Allianz Arena. Barcelona have dominated recent meetings between the two top Spanish sides, winning each of their last six clashes under the guidance of coach Luis Enrique. Barca are six points clear of Atletico at the top of La Liga and insist the recent loss to Real was just a temporary setback. We don't need to be cheered up emotionally or physically. The squad is physically very well prepared. We have proved it during these months. We have a unique opportunity to play a great match and set the bar high. Meanwhile, Atletico believe their hosts will be playing at their highest level. We believe that playing the first leg at home will make them go for the match. We are optimists. We know it's a difficult match against a very strong rival, but I believe in my team. Bayern Munich are overwhelming favourites at home against Benfica. They've comprehensively beaten the Portuguese side in their last three home matches and have never lost to the visitors in six games. But the Germans remain cautious. I know how good Portuguese football is. I know how physical they are, what a good team they are. I trust my team. I have a lot of hope, but I don't feel like the favourites at all. I never do. But we'll have to play this match and we'll have to play two good matches. Both matches get underway at quarter to nine tonight. Liesl Zankel, SABC News. And so having a quick look at the fixtures for the next two nights in the UEFA Champions League, here we go. As, uh, as you just heard at the Allianz Arena, we've got Pep Guardiola's Bayern Munich against Benfica. Incidentally, this is his last campaign as Bayern coach in the UEFA Champions League. As we all know, he will be joining City in their summer. Barcelona against Atletico Madrid. Their 39-match unbeaten run ended by the other Madrid team. That's Real Madrid over the weekend at the Camp Nou. Barcelona will be looking for revenge when they meet the Atleti. At, eight, at quarter to nine, both matches kick off. And then tomorrow, we've got PSG against Manchester United. Uh, Manchester City, I say United. Manchester United have been kicked out a long time ago. City is where Pep Guardiola will be going. A pack of plants, that's where they'll be playing. PSG is Latan Ibrahimovic's club. We're trying to see if they can get one over City. Wolfsburg, they host Real Madrid, who've had a fantastic run so far at the Volkswagen Arena. And both those matches happening tomorrow night, quarter to nine. Now, the 2016 Brutal Fruit Netball Premier League was launched yesterday amidst much fanfare and promises to be bigger and better this year. Netball fans are in for a treat when the league gets underway later this week. The third edition of the league has a longer format across the three cities of Durban, Pretoria and Johannesburg. This edition will feature 10 teams from across the country competing in a round-robin format as opposed to the two-tier system of the past. The length of the tournament has also been extended and will now be played over eight weeks at three venues in Pretoria, Johannesburg and Durban. The league has developed exponentially over the past two years, increasing the talent pool for national selection, but more importantly, it has raised the profile of the sport, taking another step closer to making netball a professional sport in South Africa.
For me, it's gratifying to be pulled by any man. You know, I'm talking about men walking the street and said, oh, wow, I think I've seen you. You are the person behind the, you know, Brutal Fruit Network Premier League. We enjoy that tournament. Where have the girls been? You know, so, you know, for so long, we didn't know that women have got such an exciting sport. It, you know, our sport is fast. It's very fast, fast and furious, faster than your rugby. You know, rugby players and soccer players, when they watch us, they say, wow, your girls must be fit. So I think, to me, that says a mouthful. The Free State Crinums are the two-time defending champions, but with competition likely to be much tougher this season, all 10 teams have a fair chance to bag the title. The tournament has grown so much and I think all the teams have grown so much as well and that's why it's going to be not so easy as the previous two years. Um, my team, we've had a lot of changes, positive changes I would call them, um, a lot of new talent and I th I'm so excited to see what they can bring to our game. The first round of matches start on Friday at the Hartfelt Arena in Pretoria with the defending champions up against last year's runners-up, the Gauteng Jaguars. Samantha Mari, SABC News, Johannesburg. Now to top of our sports bulletin, two of the top ten finishes in the 2015 Comrades Marathon. That's Joseph Mputi and Sandy Lingunuza, who claimed the sixth and ninth positions respectively, have been suspended for doping violations. Mputi and Gunuza are suspended for two years and will not be allowed to participate in the Comrades Marathon. That's until the completion of their suspensions. This ruling comes in the wake of a warning to potential cheats recently issued by Comrades Marathon Association General Manager Chris Fisher. Fisher said that race officials, marshals, volunteers and nearly 20,000 runners will all be encouraged to be on the lookout to expose any cheats at this year's Comrades Marathon, scheduled for Sunday the 29th of May. The 91st Comrades Marathon will be the 45th down run in history of the event, starting outside the Peter Marisberg City Hall and finishing at the Kingsmead Cricket Stadium in Durban. That's why we take a quick break from the bulletin. We'll be back after this short break with more news and analysis with Elvis Presley. Don't go anywhere. In Africa, technology has created many new ways of doing things. ICT is an increasingly important part of everybody's life. It's being used in education, for social media, and now for farming too. The best thing about internet for a farmer is that we get to share information. On Network, we give you all the important African technology and social media news. That's Network with Ms. Pomele Lezondi every Sunday at 7.30 p.m. Central African Time, only on SABC News. basically arrest him, continue to arrest him on behalf of the apartheid government. We are dealing with effects. We are not dealing with the causes. And for as long as we deal with effects, we are never going to solve this problem. What do these people need in prison? Why, why are they there? The PAC, as Dr. Pegu is saying, has been seeking answers and they're not coming. What kind of answers are you getting? I really think I've answered that question. I think it's a difficult question. I don't have an answer for it. How was it possible that they could operate with such impunity? The only thing you want is closure. The only thing we want is closure. And unfortunately, I don't really have sympathy for the idea that if you're too old, you shouldn't stand trial. That's Rights and Recourse with Dumile Mateza every Sunday at 2 p.m. Central African time, only on the SABC News Channel.
Now, the Social Justice Coalition has launched an application in the Western Cape High Court to demand more police resources for, for poor black communities. The coalition want the police minister, Nati Nseko, to provide better resources in the Western Cape and KwaZulu-Natal. Makasa is one of the crime-ridden areas in Kailicha, and the nearest police station is more than five kilometers away. Now, a set was, site, uh, was set aside for a police station in 2004, but a brick is yet to be laid. Now, residents say they are tired of crime in the area. J.P. Smith is the mayoral committee member, safety and security in Cape Town. Uh, he's joining us in our Cape Town studios. And we're also joined in the Cape Town studios by investigative journalist and TV producer Hazel Friedman, who won the Vodacom Western Cape TV Journalist of the Year in 2014 for her story on special assignment on the, uh, on the, on the, on the, on her Cape story. It was called, let me just see here. Um, and Hazel will probably tell us. Let me just welcome my guest first. A, a very good morning to you and welcome. Morning. Good morning. Thank you for letting us be here. Uh, JP, let me start off with you first and foremostly. Now, we just saw in that package before that the gang activity now extending to the poll. Um, are we seeing an expansion perhaps of the, the gang empires from the Cape uh, into, the, into, into the rural areas? Okay, well, perhaps let me just start by reminding you that I can speak only for what happens in Cape Town. I have no jurisdiction beyond that. And unfortunately, the primary entity involved in this discussion should be SEPs and they're not part of this discussion this morning. But that said, um, I think, yes, I was in Port Elizabeth yesterday walking with residents um, in Galvandale. They have very serious gang problems there. They've got 50 murders since the beginning of January. I think what you've seen across South Africa is the meltdown of policing strategy towards gang violence. It is unfortunately so that whilst in the past we have intermittently seen improvements in the crime stats, uh, the periods during which crime has indeed in many parts of South Africa and in many aspects have reduced, that is not true for the last two years where we've seen escalations in, in many of the um, uh, serious violent crime categories. And unfortunately, it's particularly untrue of gang violence because we have a 2% conviction rate, and I understand PE told me yesterday there is a 4% conviction rate for gang murders. That means your gangsters have long and prosperous careers unless they're killed by each other. Unfortunately, the police and the current policing strategy around gangsters is not able to take them out of the equation. And uh, this, I think, is mainly due to the disestablishment of the specialized units before and the fact that not a, a, enough focused prosecutorial resources are being spent on pursuing these gangsters, building cases against them and making sure that they're put away. Uh, there might also be problems around police collusion and corruption. So within that context, there's a little bit that the city can do, but not a great deal. Um, we only control 3% of the policing resources in Cape Town and none of the criminal justice system. That said, we have embarked on very particular and focused strategies. And if you look at gang violence in Cape Town from uh, last year till now, you see we dropped 19% in gang violence, whilst around the rest of the country, your murder rate and your murders increased. We had a reduction in, in gang violence, and I think that's not an insignificant achievement that shows that our specialized policing strategy around the gang and drug task team, and particularly our stabilization unit and our school resource officers, have been um, paying dividends. Mm -hmm. Now, Hazel, let me come back to you. Your documentary uh, on duplicity uh, of uh, the Cape gangs, tell me more about that and why did you embark on that particular story? It was a very strange and perplexing story. Um, I called it duplicity because that exactly is what was going on in terms of police being, well, I think it was Jeremy Berry who said they were being uh, economical with the truth in terms of disclosure of it basically revolved around the story of a young woman who was responsible for putting Rashid Stahi in prison for rape. Um, her life fell apart through drugs and uh, trauma. And shortly before his due release, she was, uh, she was targeted for assassination. We were all led to believe that she had died. And at the moment when we had actually announced who she was and that she died, we were informed that in fact it was a ruse, that she was alive and well, and well, not, not well, but had been taken into a witness protection program, which in effect really just exposed her again to whoever was looking for her and could come after her. Um, and it was about, as I said, the duplicity on the part of the police. It was about the fact that on the Cape Flats in this war zone, in this land of hard living, nothing is ever as it seems. Who is colluding with whom? Um, the fact that 
people know exactly who is responsible for the heinous crimes that are committed there but will not come forward because they're terrified because they will be taken out. And it's this climate of mistrust and trauma that we really found ourselves in the middle of. And I think it was just our own sense of trauma, seeing communities being wrenched apart, living in war zones on a daily basis, children not being able to go to school because they might get caught in the crossfire of gang violence, and yet no end in sight. So that was really what it was about. Now, now JP, let me come back to you. What is the extent of the, of the gang violence in Cape Town and, and the growth of gangs in the area? Well, I mean, in the last year, we saw that uh, murder rate for gang murders, specifically in Cape Town, dropped to about 380 murders. Uh, that's 86 less than the year before, so an alarming figure. Uh, three years ago, Cape murders, gang murders in Cape Town made up one-fifth of all the murders in the city, so 20% of the murders. Uh, after two years of the strategy around the stabilization unit and the gang and drug task team, wielding the limited powers the city has access to relative to what national government can wield, uh, we have seen a reduction. It's hard to claim how much of that Cape Town can realistically claim. It's difficult to disentangle cause and effect here. But uh, last year, murder, gang murders made up 11.4 percent of the, the murders, so just about half the, the number of murders on our gang murders that used to be. Uh, and it's still a, a very, very alarming figure. And the fact remains is that um, Hazel is completely right. The gangsters have long, are able to carry on doing what they do and are not effectively brought to justice. Gangsters hang around for a long time. And we are very excited about the George Thomas uh, Gewalt a uh, case that uh, saw him be put away with many of his um, shooters. That's, that was brilliant, and kudos to everybody in SAPS and the NPA involved in that. Now we need to see it replicated another 50 times to take out all our other, other heavy hitters. And I'm afraid until we do that, you can't stabilize the suburbs in the Cape Flats enough to run the other projects that would in turn help prevent the resuscitation of that. So it's a bit of a chicken and egg situation. People say, well, you must fight unemployment, you must create jobs, you must do all these other things. But within those communities with the levels of gang violence and gang intimidation as it is, that's very difficult to do. People say the state of housing is a, is a driving factor for it. When the council does upgrades of the council rental stock, the gangsters come and intimidate, beat up and kill the housing contractors who then end up paying protection money to the gangsters and then the city gets embroiled in that whole mess uh, because saps find out about it and don't act on it for six months. Um, and that is, that is a, a, a very, very difficult situation. So the truth is we're going to need to see far more pointed and effective policing investigations against these high flyers, and many of them, more of them put away. When we stabilize the city, then the other extended public works programs, job creation, the violence prevention through urban upgrading that we're doing in suburbs like Hanover Park and Mannenberg, and the uh, Mayor's Urban Regeneration Campaign and other suburbs like Bishop Lavers, Bontieville, Atlantis and Ocean View, then have a realistic hope of making some progress. Now, May it I seems... It, so, sorry, Hazel, I interrupted you there. No, I, I just did wanted to add something, and I really do also agree that there needs to be much more effective law enforcement and prosecution and conviction. But I think, and your next guest, Don Pinnock, will underscore this. Um, mm. There is a terrible lack in terms of, of role models in the areas most afflicted by gangsterism, um, mm. a lack of rituals that enable young people to make the transition from childhood to adulthood. They have to fill that gap, and they fill that gap with ghetto families or gang families who give them a sense of validation and, and of worth. Mm -hmm. The other problem is, yes, when we do convict gangsters and they go to prison and they come out, many of them do come out reformed gangsters. Mm -hmm. What happens to them then is they go through another period of what we call liminality where they are just stuck betwixt and between. They don't belong to a gang, they've torn up the credit card, but there is no substantial support system for them to reintegrate properly and be uh, accepted back into mainstream society. M m one of the chief sources of my story is a wonderful friend of mine, Mahadin Bensel, who was the subject of a book called The Number by Johnny Steinberg. He has been crime-free since 2003 after spending most of his adult years in, in prison. He is destitute. He has applied to try and volunteer for... for, for um, uh, community initiatives in Mannenberg. Mm -hmm. He has never ever been accepted by the social structures that would find his input so useful. 
Every single year, though, in Christmas and, and Easter, he's, he, he raises funds to take Easter eggs to the youth that he once terrorized. People like this who've come out of prison and are resolved to be crime-free need much greater support than they are receiving from the city, from social development, mm -hmm. and from, from their communities. So, so you're talking about community integration, but talking about communities, uh, JP, is there enough community support uh, for the projects that, uh, that is being launched in these areas to rid the communities of, uh, of these gangs? Look, just perhaps, just quickly back to what Hazel said, I don't agree with her that the city has to do more for reintegration. Um, offender reintegration is specifically not a local government competency. It's very much national government's work. Mm -hmm. That said, we haven't left it waiting for them to do something about it. Uh, we've, we've engaged the Department of Correctional Services. We've had the first job creation already for offenders, where through the EPWP program we have given employment to people being released on parole so that they don't have to return to a life in crime. And we've just recently met with them about expanding that program quite significantly. So it's something we've taken seriously and we're actually running with, even though there is no realistic way in the Constitution and in terms of the schedule of mandates for the different spheres of government that you could make that local government's job. That is, that is very specifically assigned to national government. No. That said, mm -hmm. in terms of support, I think that we would always want more. Every single public meeting you go to, the police, everybody involved, decry the lack of support from communities, the extent to which communities protect gangsters. Those are benefit from that patronage and the criminal economy that the gangsters have established. Cry um, or, or uh, will shield gangsters, will throw stones at the police, will attack police officers. Last night it happened again where police officers were attacked in that manner. SAPS members in this case is very frustrating. Um, but I must say I'm encouraged to see the tip-offs we're getting. Um, when we started our gang and drug task team, we were lucky if we got a handful of tip-offs a month. Now we're getting 25, 28, 30 tip-offs a week. I can sometimes on my phone alone during the day get four tip-offs which I pass on to our gang unit. Many of those are hitting dirt. I had a tip-off from a person about a broken electricity box in Bontieville where he thought the gangsters were storing something in, passed it on to the gang and drug task team. They were there in under 20 minutes and indeed that's where we found ammunition and an R4 rifle. Mm -hmm. So many of these tip-offs are spot on and are helping us make a dent to the yeah. extent that we now take more guns right. off the street in five months than we used to do in five years just, before just, that. So the, an intelligence-driven policing is definitely the answer. Just in closing now, that's the question I wanted to pose to you. Is that the only solution though? No, I mean the policing is the one part I'm responsible for, but it is a very small part. You need to do a whole lot more to intercede in, in what is happening in these communities. And Don is spot on. His new book, Gang Town, uh, explains it very well, and he's got a very cogent set of interventions proposed at the back of the, the book uh, around what needs to be done. I have, in fact, arranged for our mayoral committee to get a presentation from him on that and on his recommendations because I think he's spot on with them. Uh, mm -hmm. And there is a lot more we can do. All it right. is going to take much more resources than local government mm -hmm. can muster. Uh, remember, our funding is, is committed. Our funding is committed on the services we deliver. There isn't a great deal of maneuver for, for local government in terms of its spending priorities. Mm -hmm. um, we are there to render the basic services that the Constitution enjoins us to do. Mm -hmm. yes. the, there is going to have to be a much more uh, robust and meaningful contribution from national government on this and a partnership. Uh, in order to put in place the systems that have to be there to prevent young people from getting into the clutches of this. But mm -hmm. I must tell you, hope is not lost. Don um, introduced us to his book about rituals and rites of passage into adulthood. Uh, we embraced that very firmly. We created the Metro Police Cadet Program, our Metro Police Youth Camps. We've had 1,600 young people on those Metro Police Camps in the last two years, directly in response to Pinnock's um, suggestions. And our cadets are now 100 in number. The first of them are getting promoted and right. are getting employment themselves in Metro Police. And so we're taking that, those proposals uh, very seriously and looking at the whole of society mm -hmm. interventions, even from a policing perspective. Uh, Hazel, just in closing, uh, what have you found in terms of the documentary that, uh, that you've done? Uh, is there more that can be done, uh, especially not just in Cape Town, but across uh, South Africa? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're seeing the eruption of gangsterism in Port Elizabeth as well. We're seeing it in the rural hinterlands. We're seeing it everywhere. We're seeing it in, in Izamo Yetu. And so much more needs to be done. But I think it all, and I hate to sound trite, but it all really does begin at home. And it's about cultivating and nurturing a generation of youngsters 
who at the moment don't seem to have any hope in the future of this country, who have role models who are criminals, leadership that is weak um, on, on a national level, uh, corruption that is rife, and that seems to be the way that they think that they can get some kind of validation. For them, crime pays because nothing else does. And it's about getting those youth to start believing in themselves and getting validation for all the right reasons. And then, of course, for those gangsters who have come out of prison, who want to make a difference, but are maybe too, too old and, 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 and frail now because they've lived a life, most they've been career criminals. It's also about supporting them and showing that you actually can change and that second chances are possible. We don't just talk the, we mustn't just talk the talk, we've got to walk the walk with them. Thank you so much to both of you for joining us. Uh, that uh, was uh, uh, Western Cape. Uh, uh, that was Hazel Friedman who won the Vodacom Western Cape TV Journalist of the Year in 2013 for her story on special assignment on the Cape Wars called Duplicity, as well as the mayoral committee member, J.P. Smith, in studio. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. very interesting discussion we had today that's our theme looking at the gangs and the question that we pose to you of course what else do you think can be done uh, to rid and purge our communities of these gangs you can let us know on the facebook page as well as the twitter handle and some of you have responded already let's take a look at uh, some of the comments that you've sent through to us on the twitter handle mohato says uh, uh, gangs exist cause too many people are unemployed so to some Joining is the way to get bread on the table, so says Mahato Jr. This one from Ntuzake says, uh, gang violence must end in South Africa because they kill our young people, uh, the future presidents and the law must play their role. These are some of your comments on the Twitter handle at SABC Newsroom as well as on our Facebook page. You can still keep them coming and uh, we'll post them on our Facebook page afterwards so you can look at all the comments. Let's now take a look at the front pages of the newspapers on the continent. And we're starting off in Namibia, economic change, uh, not mere tweaks. A Namibian report that the country's economic transformation must not only be mere tweaks, as nothing will change. The minister in charge of the National Planning Commission in the presidency, Tom Alwendo, had said, moving on to Swaziland. The Swaziland Observer says that after concerns by Parliament, over 96 million, the Lilangeni uh, jet uh, set aside rather in the national budget for the purchase of the state jet, the Ministry of Finance has listened and cancelled the allocation and the money has now been taken to the consolidated funds. And then in Nigeria, the uh, Daily Trust reports that the late President Amuro Musa Yar Adua's uh, economic advisor, Al Haji Tumino Yakubu, yesterday narrated how he was attacked in Kandanabi. Assailants, he thought, were kidnappers. How I was attacked, the headline there. Those are all the headlines in the newspapers on the continent. But for now, let's take a look at uh, your weather forecast. As you know, it's, uh, you can feel it now, right now, the weather is getting a little bit cooler. Philip Hawkins will guide us through that period. Very good morning to you, Phil. Yeah, thank you so much and a very good morning. Yes, indeed, change of season is upon us and uh, it is bringing in some pretty cool temperatures through South Africa's southern parts anyway. What we're seeing for today through Central Africa is a lot of cloud cover. Yesterday we saw most of that cloud cover and the rainfall really forecast over the eastern regions of uh, Central Africa. For today we're going to see a lot of that rainfall beginning there, but it is going to begin to dissipate. We're going to see a lot of rainfall also coming in from the west and uh, causing some fairly strong showers and thunder showers over those western areas. Those showers also extend down towards Cape Town's eastern coastline, uh, rather South Africa's eastern coastline. Cape Town though today and into tomorrow beginning to see a lot more sunshine and uh, much more pleasant conditions behind that frontal system. In fact, as we speak about it, a 21 degree maximum for today, but it is going to warm up very, very steadily. Port Elizabeth at 23 degrees and a lot of rainfall all the way throughout uh, South Africa's eastern interior. In fact, around Peter Maritzburg and uh, other parts of the eastern uh, coastlines of South Africa, we're expecting widespread showers and heavy rainfall. Please be aware of that if you are going to be in the area. Another 28 degree high forecast for Harare. Moving further north, Lusaka expects rainfall today. 27 degrees and we're seeing temperatures up to 33 in Dar es Salaam. 
Nice uh, rainy day forecast all the way throughout these areas. Uh, good news for some areas. Of course, the crops are going to do well there. Definitely good news for Addis Ababa. 26 degrees, another rainy day there. And uh, fantastic news there. A little bit of cloud cover over Juba for today. 36 degree maximums in Khartoum at a 40 degree maximum, making it surprisingly one of the cooler days that we've seen in the past few months. Tehran's at 20 degrees, temperatures warming up in Cairo up to 33 degree maximums. Now this is ahead of a strong frontal system, which as you can see, we move further west along the northern coastlines of Africa there, is uh, beginning to affect those northern coastal cities. Tripoli just ahead of that frontal system, 33 degrees, and just behind it, Algiers, 18 degree maximums. You can see huge temperature differences here, and that of course is the result of that frontal system. Marrakesh peaks at 15 degrees, rainfall all the way throughout this, these uh, regions as a result of that lower pressure. And uh, of course, uh, Bamako also expecting a bit of rainfall for today, 42 degree maximums. So it is going to be hot. And of course, humidity rising high after that rainfall and uh, such high temperatures. Cloud cover forecast in Lagos, but uh, no rainfall for today. Surrounding areas of the uh, less populated regions might just get a little bit. And that extends down towards Yaoundé, uh, Bangui. These areas expecting rainfall uh, all the way throughout the day. In fact, this is where we were expecting those showers to intensify to about a 60% chance of showers and thunder showers. This is where you can contact us. Email us, weather at sabc.co.za. Or give us a call, 011-714-5077 is the weather desk number. That is where I leave your weather for now. Stay tuned.
It's 1100 hours Central Africa time on this Tuesday, the 5th of April 2016. This is Newsroom on SABC News, Channel 404, Jumbo Africa, and a very warm welcome to the final hour as we broadcast live from our Auckland Park studios in Johannesburg, South Africa, to the rest of the African continent. I'm Elvis Preston. And I'm Renee Vest. And we'll be with you until 12 o'clock. As you know, we're also streaming live on YouTube. The entire show is available on your YouTube channel. Question of the day, we're asking you, what else do you think can be done to purge or rid our communities from gangs? You heard all the arguments today. I want to know from you. Send us your comments on the Twitter handle at SABC Newsroom, as well as on our Facebook page. But first, let's take a look at your news headlines. Opposition parties in Parliament to push for a secret ballot in their bid to remove the President Jacob Zuma from office. Authorities, including the South African Revenue Services, take a look at local companies and citizens implicated in the so-called Panama Papers. And Kenya's Deputy President William Ruto finds out his fate later today as the ICC decides on whether to strike his case off the court roll. Now those are all your headlines, but before we get to the news with Renee in a short while, let's find out from Kendall Makhamate what's happening on the sports front. A very good morning to you, Kendall. Elvis, good morning. Good morning, Renee. Very good to have you. Uh, very good to be joining you on the show, and good morning to you at home. This is what we've got for you in the sports today. The last spot for the Nedbank Cup, last 16, will get decided in a Tswane derby between Super Sports United and the University of Pretoria tonight. And staying with football, Barcelona and Atletico Madrid face off on the business end of the UEFA Champions League. All this as the FIFA Ethics Committee investigates one of its own members. That's Juan Pedro Damiani. That's what we have for you in the sports in a nutshell. We'll be back at about 11.30 or so. Back to the main desk for the news. Thank you, Kendall. He will be back later. But before we get there, let's find out from uh, Rene what's happening on the news. Top story. Some opposition parties in Parliament are expected to push for a secret ballot today during the National Assembly motion to remove President Jacob Zuma from office. Meanwhile, the ANC's National Working Committee met at an undisclosed venue in Cape Town yesterday to consider last week's constitutional court ruling. The Democratic Alliance, who called for the motion, says the matter transcends party politics and affects all South Africans. It's not the DA's first attempt to remove the president. But this time, the party says it's backed by a court. Last week, the Constitutional Court ordered the president to pay for non-security upgrades at his Nkandla residence, as instructed by the public protector. For the very first time since the 1994 election, we have the highest court in the land, the Constitutional Court, that has now found that the president conclusively violated uh, the Constitution, violated his oath of office, and did not behave in a lawful manner. And that is a very clear trigger of Section 89 of the Constitution. There is no other time when it has been more important than now, because the Constitutional Court declared that President Zuma violated the Constitution, and to that extent, uh, he must be removed. And the perfect body to do so is Parliament. You must exhaust that avenue uh, if there is to be something beyond Parliament that can be done. The Freedom Front Plus calls it a historic event. Last time they did not listen to reason, they listened to their party caucus and their party decisions and the Constitutional Court found that decision of them to be unconstitutional. We hope that common sense will prevail. We, have, we really appeal to all ANC members to vote in terms of their conscience. They've all uh, was responsible and, and, and they all know what needs to be done. No member of a political party uh, or no member of any political party since 1994 has ever voted differently from the party line. Even those uh, opposition parties, they will be voting in accordance with their party line. Why would they expect differently from the ANC? That is uh, just sheer uh, hypocrisy. The IFP says it's still deciding which route to take, while the UDM wouldn't divulge its plans. Abra Barbia, SABC News, Parliament. Kenya's Deputy President William Ruto will find out later today 
whether the International Criminal Court will throw out the case against him and journalist Joshua Sang. Both men deny the charges of crimes against humanity in connection with the deaths of 1,200 people in violence following elections in 2007. Kenya's post-election violence brought the country to its knees as the opposition party disputed the results of the presidential vote. The weeks of bloodshed left more than 100,000 people displaced. Both men deny accusations that they provoked violence that killed more than 1,000 people. Ruta says the ICC's decision to charge him was only part of the process of a national reconciliation. Ruto is expected to run in the elections in 2017. Right, let's take a look at Twanid University of Technology, where two Shoshengubu campuses, north and south, are reopening today. Safety and security is expected to be tight. The campuses were shut down on the 4th of March following violent protests, which disrupted the registration process. Students will be expected to provide proof of academic registration at the entrance and will also have to provide proof of identity. Our reporter Fana Peter is in Shoshenguvwe at TUT to give us an update from the ground. Good morning. Thank you and good morning. We are here at TUT in Shoshenguvwe where the situation has returned to normal. The disturbances that started at the beginning of this year made it impossible for the teaching here and learning to take place. But apparently all the problems in, in this uh, institution have been resolved. The school was closed on the 7th of March and uh, now is the reopening day today. And with me here we have the Vice Chancellor of the institution, uh, Professor Mukula, who will then explain to us uh, the, ro the road they have taken or they have traveled in order to resolve these problems. I'm going to ask him to briefly tell us uh, what has happened, what they have done in order to achieve this. Prof, it's back to school today. It looks normal. Is it normal? Definitely normal. Maybe let me first correct the, your, your presentation. I'm a deputy vice chancellor teaching learning technology. Indeed, as you can see, the students are back. They started coming back yesterday morning, and now they are back in class. Everybody is happy. Indeed, we try to solve all the problems that actually, actually did develop us in the first term. We hope from now onwards, students will only focus into their learning and continue with their studies, that come end of the year, then they take exam like every student. We are quite excited. I want to assure parents out there, their children are safe, police are here, security is up, up and running. We only make sure that now all the students who registered for TU, TSO, are allowed on campus. So I'm quite happy this morning. Uh, in the problems that you had uh, with the students, would you say all were resolved? I can tell you, we even resolved them before they even left for, for, for the, the, that strike. They brought us a memorandum. In that memorandum, we actually solved each and everything that they raised, except two items. I'll give you one that we say we can't solve. They wanted that to, to demerge from TUT. We say, no ways. TUT is one. You can't have your independent structure as, as an independent structure. That's not going to happen. The measure was a government project, and we support it. So whoever wants to demerge, we say, sorry, you're in the wrong place here. There are also allegations that students who caused problems here are not registered with you. Can I, you confirm that? I can assure you that now these guys are not registered. I made an affidavit to the point that now they're not registered. For them, they've got nothing to lose. They actually fool our students here to say, we are talking for you while they know that now themselves are not registered. So for them is to steer the problem here and actually go out. Some of them are going to work now. I can tell you one of them is a journalist who is going to start working as a journalist. For him to come and cause problems here, he has nothing to lose. So this is why I say my student must be very vigilant. Whoever come and talk to them, say, join strike. Ask them, are you a student first? Are you registered? If you are registered now, what program? Thank you. That's Professor Mukula here at the university. But we, we, we randomly selected two students to find out if they are really here to study and if their problems have been resolved and whether they are happy to be back here. Let's hear from you. Are you happy to be back here at school? Yes, I'm happy to be back at school because it's been a while now that the, uh, the closing of the school did, did disrupt us and then now we're glad that we're back and yeah, I'm sure that everything will go according to plan. As the chamber said, yeah, so I'm delighted to be back, sir. 
And what about you? Very, very happy, sir. Can't complain. We're back to school. I mean, most of us come from far away places just to, to study here. I mean, it's, um, it's, a great, it's a great thing that we're back to school. And um, one thing I, want, I just want to say is that if they continue with the strikes, we as students co will conduct a strike against strikes. Do you understand? So that we can be back to school because we really, really appreciate being here. That's uh, all about uh, the TUT here for now. Back to the studio. Thank you very much, Fana. That, of course, is our reporter, Fana Piete, live from TUT campuses. Meanwhile, the university has assured its students that it has resolved issues that led to the shutdown of the two Shoshenguvwe campuses. Speaking to SABC News earlier, TUT spokesperson Villa Dereta said the situation is back to normal and the university is doing everything to make sure that no further disruptions take place. One of the issues has been about uh, financial problems that students experience. What we have done, we already started with a campaign in November. We had a signing of agreements of debt that students could um, enter into with the institution. And I think to a large extent we have now resolved those issues and students will be able to register. We do not um, deny students to register because of financial problems. Mm -hmm. Uh, we do not offer free education because it's against the Higher Education Act, but we assist students to sign the agreement of debt to enable them to register. Now, Villa, what measures have been put in place to avoid another shutdown, and are you confident that this will hold? We will be monitoring the situation very clo closely, and there is a court interdict in place on, at TUT, and it's, it's applicable to those campuses as well. We will identify people who cause trouble and we will deal with them. The South African police is also assisting us to identify people who make trouble. And if they transgress the laws, they will be dealt with by the police. If they transgress our rules, we will deal with them. We also had a meeting with parents on the 29th of March to get them involved. And there, there were just over 500 parents who attended that meeting. Um, following that meeting, a parent forum was established where parents will now also engage with the institution on a regular basis to assist us in resolving issues and um, to, to uh, address issues that their children may have. Research shows that pornography in South Africa is a major problem. Children continue to suffer various violations, including indecent exposure to pornographic material. Child pornography includes indecent images of children and sexually exploitive images of children. Earlier, SABC News spoke to advocate Victoria Baloga Fatolkan, who is a constitutional law academic and the co-founder of the Access to Judge program at the University of KwaZulu-Natal Law School, and we asked her how big the problem is. It's quite big here in South Africa because... Um, so because of so many factors, um, the tourist, uh, tourism industry is growing, there's exposure here and there, and also the perpetrators are just, you know, exploiting and also expanding into areas and countries where, where, they, um, where they believe that the market is. So um, initially, proud to, 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 to the presentation that we had last week, we also felt, OK, maybe um, the problem is so rampant in, South, I mean, in, in the US and South Africa is protected. But from the cases that are coming out, from uh, evidence, uh, evidence presented uh, via research, um, and even speaking with the NPA um, and, some, uh, and, and SAPS, we realized that this uh, this abuse is gaining ground seriously in South Africa because we have internal pedophiles, we have external pedophiles who would also come into the country and, you know, um, and exploit our children, um, working together also with local syndicates. So, um, and also given the age of internet, uh, uh, um, I mean, the technology, the advancement in technology, um, let's not forget that perpetrators and, um, are, are in it for business. It's all about profit. It's all about also feeling that they are much stronger or they have power over the victims. Mm -hmm. So, yes, South Africa is actually on the map, and it's really, really bad. 
A livestock auctioneer is in trouble for disposing of a herd of cattle belonging to a community of Dilokwaneng outside Brits in the northwest. It is alleged that the auctioneer intercepted the planned sale of the cattle from a group of alleged livestock thieves and promised to hand the animals back to the community. However, after a long time of giving people the runaround, it was discovered the cattle have been sold without the knowledge of the owners. The community received the livestock and a vast portion of the land consisting of a game farm from the government as part of the successful land claims process a few years ago. Former New Zealand Prime Minister Helen Clark has entered the race to be the next UN Secretary General. She is currently the UN's highest ranking woman as head of its Depart Development Program. Clark is the eighth candidate to replace Ban Ki-moon, who completes his second term at the end of the year. She says she's got the skills and experience, fully equipped to meet the challenges of one of the toughest jobs in the world. As one of the longest serving Prime Ministers of New Zealand, and now having been leader of UNDP and chair of the UN Development Group these past seven years, I believe I am the right person for the job. Of the eight candidates already nominated, four, including Helen Clark, are women. The others include Vesna Pusik, a former foreign minister of Croatia, Bulgaria's Irina Bokova, who currently heads UNESCO, and Natalia German, a former Deputy Prime Minister of Moldova. Clark was asked about the significance of a woman leading the UN. I am seeking the position because I believe I'm the best person for the job. Obviously I'm a woman, but I've never sought election on the basis of being a woman. I've always sought election, and I've sought election many times in my life, uh, as the best person for the job. Uh, in the normal course of events, I, like Advocates of gender equality and women's empowerment around the world would like to see women have a fair chance, an equal chance, at every position of responsibility. That applies to the United Nations, as it applies to, to governments, as it applies to leadership positions in general. All UN Secretaries General to date have been men. Efforts are being made in the selection process for greater transparency with countries openly nominating candidates for the first time. The General Assembly is expected to hold open hearings or interviews with candidates while the Security Council will determine a final candidate for the General Assembly to vote on. And while the unofficial geographic rotation suggests the next Secretary General should be Eastern European, diplomats have insisted they will select the best candidate for the job. Sherwin Bryceby's SABC News, New York. The deepening hunger crisis in Malawi is threatening the survival of children. And also it is the life-threatening part of malnutrition. Malawi is facing its worst food crisis in nine years. Mugabe is the world's oldest sitting head of state, ahead of Queen Elizabeth of Britain. The veteran leader seeks to temporarily forget his party's problems and instead focus on his legacy. But he shows no sign of slowing down or stepping down from power after 36 years in office. It's February 2016, and the fees have not fallen. Some other students are struggling, they don't have money to even pay the rent outside. They're struggling with food and they don't have a place to stay. I have lost four billion as far as I'm now paying for jobs at funeral palace to watch like, dead bodies to finish my studies. The race to replace Uganda's president, Yoweri Museveni, after 30 years in power, is coming to an end. Voting him out and letting him hand over power peacefully to another president would be the biggest sign of Uganda's democratic maturity.
Now time for your regional news. South Africa's Independent Electoral Commission, the IEC, have postponed all by-elections, pending the outcome of its constitutional court appeal over the addresses on the voters' roll. The Electoral Commission says they decided to postpone all by-elections, including those scheduled for the 6th of April 2016, in the light of the continued uncertainty regarding the validity of the voters' roll, where the Commission is not in possession of the voters' addresses. Now, SABC reporter Tolofelo Matabedi is in Tlokwe to check the situation for us. A very good morning to you, Tolo. And can you brief us on the IEC decision to postpone all the by-elections there? Yeah, Elvis, uh, Tlokwe is where it all started. Uh, the ruling uh, by the electoral court in Tlokwe is the one that actually set the cat amongst the pigeon, if, uh, so to speak. And uh, the IEC has now taken a decision or had taken a decision then to challenge that ruling. So they're indicating that until uh, they go to the constitutional court where they will be challenging the ruling by the electoral court, uh, by elections throughout the country cannot uh, take place or cannot continue. With me here is uh, Professor Andre Duvenache, who is a political analyst here in the Northwest Province, to tell us about exactly what the ruling means. Uh, Prof, uh, welcome. Thank you, Cholufelu. Prof, can you just tell us, what, is this, uh, what, what does this decision by the IEC to postpone uh, by elections actually mean? Tolofelo, it seems to me as if everything is starting here in Tlokwe Potsch of Strom, but everything is ending also here. Now, what we are talking about, if you look at the Constitution and related legislation, we need to end the term of local government towards 18th of May. That is not giving us a lot of time to continue with by-elections. Therefore, the IEC made the decision not to continue with the 12 by-elections. Therefore, I believe, basically, we are not going to see any by-elections before the national local elections. So, basically, we are now into the national local elections with its own challenges with regard to a number of things. But then why did, did the IPC not maybe go ahead and say, you know what, uh, let's not go to my elections, let's just, you know, go straight into uh, the national elections? Well, Tzolu Felu, they are playing political games, they are playing for time, and it's clear that the decision is to the advantage of the ANC not only within the clockwork context where the political regime here is going to continue but also on a national local level and talking about clockwork what does it really mean for clockwork the, the council the anc council is basically surviving they do not have any local elections before the national local elections. Therefore, they can continue. They keep control over the powers of local government, and that is clearly to their advantage when it comes to the national local elections. But then the, the scale seems not to be tipped in their favor, looking at the representation in the municipality. Then what does that mean? Uh, you know, what sort of council is presiding over Tokwena? Well, at the moment, it is a divided council. They are not taking decisions. They are basically in a stalemate type of situation. We are not seeing strong government and governance coming from the council. Therefore, it is negative when it comes to things like service delivery and the general management of Klokwe Pochestrom. Looking at the situation as it exists, you have said it that we're heading towards uh, local government elections in the country. You know, in Tlokwe, how do you see that playing itself out, looking at, you know, what Tlokwe has been, what Tlokwe is? Well, my understanding is that this will come uh, with strong reaction from opposition parties. I believe we are in for a very interesting and dynamic political phase in the Tlokwe environment. My understanding is that there are a lot of grassroots support for opposition parties. We are looking here at the EFF lines, we are looking at the NUMSA lines, we are looking at the Democratic Alliance. And I believe that the ANC to a certain extent is vulnerable here, as is the case also in the Nelson Mandela Metropole, also in parts of Gauteng. Therefore, I think we are going to have a very interesting, dynamic and maybe even conflict-orientated environment in the build-up to the national local elections. That is to say, if 
the national local elections are going to take place. There are big concerns about the IEC and verified addresses implicating as many as 15 million voters. In that context, it is still controversial. Thank you very much, Prof. You've heard it right here, Professor Andre Dubenache saying Kokwe is where it started and probably it will be where all of this is going to be wrapped up. Back to you in the studio, Elvis. Hello, fellow. Thank you so much uh, for that report there from uh, Tlokwe. And we will be discussing the IEC situation on Friday in depth, in depth rather, to look at all the situations, the pros and the cons of uh, the IEC decision in Tlokwe. So you have to stay tuned. That's here on your favorite news channel, Newsroom. Now, Bata Mia's school for the deaf and the blind at Tabanchu, east of Bloemfontein, is scheduled to open after learners were sent home early last term following disruptions. Students went on the rampage, breaking furniture and windows. Deaf learners complain that uh, preferential treatment is given to the blind learners. The students demanded that the principal step down because she is not resolving the issues that they've raised. Our reporter Ishmael Madiba is at the school this morning. A very good morning to you, Ishmael, and welcome. Can you tell us what is currently happening there? What is the situation at the moment at the school? Well, good morning, Elvis. Well, yes, as you can see, we are right here at Bartamea, a school for the deaf and blind here it, in, in Tabanchu. Uh, the, the, today, what is happening is uh, the Department of uh, the Department of uh, Education officials are holding a meeting with the teachers and uh, stakeholders at the school, uh, and with with the way of resolving the issue. Uh, what was supposed to happen today was that the, the, the department officials were supposed to have a meeting with the parents where they were going to sign a pledge to, take, to, 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 to confirm that uh, no disruptions would, uh, would happen in the school to, to pave the way so that uh, learning and teaching, proper learning and teaching could take place. But unfortunately, that meeting has been postponed due to other logistical challenges. But the meeting has been uh, scheduled for this com upcoming weekend. But today, like, the meeting is uh, currently going on where the, the teachers are meeting with the department of officials to map a way forward and the learners are, some of the learners have already come back to school have reported back to school and some are already uh, as we're speaking some were, have been coming back to school and uh, we, here we've got one of the, the director of the department of education uh, who's going to tell us what the program the program of the day what the department is trying to do to sort out the the the, the, the problem at this school uh, mr bob Clady, can you briefly tell us, uh, as, the, as the department, what are you trying to normalize the situation at this particular school? Um, as a department, we are trying to get the school back to normality um, uh, with respect to what happened just before the schools um, uh, closed for the first time. We have uh, had meetings, uh, firstly, with our school governing body uh, last week Friday uh, to map out the way forward in terms of what is going to happen. And, um, to, and also the school management team also to agree in terms of uh, how we are going to normalize the situation. Well, like today, when the, when the schools uh, are reopening, and uh, we are, today we are meeting with the teacher component, all the teachers uh, in, the, in the school, to also give them the feedback with respect to the way forward, and also to invite them uh, to give their inputs in terms of uh, how we are collectively going to move forward to take the school uh, uh, to normality. And we are now also uh, meeting with the learners because with our meeting with the learners, part of our meeting is to uh, listen to, uh, respond to the grievances that they wrote, the letters that they communicated to the department, both the blind and the deaf learners, and to respond to that, but also to um, a pledge that they must commit themselves that the situation is going to be uh, normal, there will be discipline, teaching and learning will take place, and that the recovery plan, uh, in terms of the lost time, uh, with regard to academic uh, uh, programs, is going to be uh, properly uh, implemented. So uh, uh, next week, Saturday, we will be meeting with the, on request of the school governing body, uh, because we wanted to have a meeting with the parents today, but the school governing body requested that uh, for logistical reasons, the meeting can only be successful if we have it over the weekend. So the meeting will be next week Saturday, where we invite all the parents of our learners at, uh, at Bartimea uh, to give them the feedback and also the turnaround plan in terms of how we are going to improve uh, performance uh, at our school here. 
Uh, can you can you tell us about that turnaround plan? What exactly are you going to to do to ensure that you recover the lost time? The turnaround plan. The first thing that we are going to do is that uh, we are uh, going to have a recovery plan, academic recovery plan, for the days that were lost, so that our our educators they can go the extra mile with our learners, so that uh, they can be able to cover the syllabus, the part that was not taught uh, before the end of the first term. But secondly, we are looking into other matters that uh, affect the school. For instance, the human resource issues with regard to post-provisioning, uh, staff establishment issues, and um, uh, how, as a department, you can uh, immediately assist the, uh, I mean, the school. Um, second, thirdly, we are looking at the issues of the programs that the school is offering here. They have um, a vocational programs that we feel that they have a critical role to play when it comes to artisan development strategy for the country. If you remember that uh, this is the decade of the artisan, and uh, we want uh, schools like Bartimea to contribute effectively, uh, quantitatively and qualitatively in terms of producing more artisan. But also, we are looking into how we improve teaching and learning with respect to our grade 12 learners and all the other grades so that uh, we improve from the performance of last year of 78% to 100% this year. Among the allegations or the concerns that the learners raised last time was that the poor allocation of resources and also they spoke about ill treatment from the, the alleged the alleged ill treatment from by the by the principal and the deputy principal. How as a department are you responding to those allegations or the concerns raised by the learners? The, 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 with respect to the principal and the two deputy principal, after our consultations with the SGB and the, on the matters that were raised by the union also in Barichula Nehau and also um, the, the um, other stakeholders here, even in the department. We have come to a determination as a department that uh, we, we transfer the principal temporarily and the two deputy principals to the district um, for a month. It's a temporary transfer for a month to allow, uh, and then we are going to have investigations uh, with respect to those allegations. Uh, and I want to just reiterate its allegations that uh, needs to be investigated further uh, by our uh, labor relations unit and uh, our anti-corruption and fraud unit. And uh, that will determine the way forward uh, in terms of uh, what happens with uh, our principal and the two deputy uh, uh, principals. We have uh, in the meantime appointed one of our officials from the district to act as a principal and uh, together with the SGB they will then appoint uh, two acting uh, uh, principals, I mean, two acting deputy principals, I'm sorry. With respect to, to the resources, we have also said from the side of the department we'll be looking uh, out of the turnaround plan. It must come out very clearly with respect to the kind of support that the school needs. So that from the side of the department also, we must be seen to be supporting the school uh, to turn around to become one of the best schools that it used to be when it used to produce 100% passes throughout and be one of our best schools in the country uh, uh, overall. That was uh, Mr. Bob Tadi, one of the directors from the Department of Education outlying, outlying a situation here at Bartamia School in Tabanchu. Back to you in the studio. That's our reporter Ismail Mudiba there in um, Bartimaeus School, School of the Deaf in Tabanchu. Uh, worrying situation there. Now the Gauteng Health MEC Kodani Maslangu says that the picket up strike should be urgently resolved to prevent the health hazards posed by the uncollected waste. The problem has also resulted in the increase of the rodent manifestation. She spoke to SABC News earlier this morning and was asked if there were contingency plans to collect the piling garbage. The city has uh, put up a comprehensive plan uh, headed by the d disaster, the EMS team, uh, with Pick It Up and, and all of that. They've mobilized uh, a private sector companies to come on board. What the Department of Health is doing is to support from an environmental health point, point of view, as well as our infectious um, um, outbreak response team to go into those areas and ensure that areas where there's a pileup of debt, those after they've been clean, uh, the environmental health look into those and to ensure that indeed they there is no any other um, a, 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 a problem that can be picked up later. And I think of importance here is the highly dense uh, populated areas like the townships, as well as the informal settlements in the main, your deep slope, Ivory Park, as well as Alexandra. Those we need to pay attention to those and the plans of the city include those kind of areas as well. Yeah. Let's turn our attention now to the health risks associated here. I mean, 
when you read some of the articles that are out and talking about the health risks associated with this piling up of rubbish, I mean, some of those things we can talk about... Um, hepatitis, polio excreted from human feces and obviously mm. little babies nappies that are just lying mm. in the rubbish. I mean that's that's the reality of what it's like. Um, you've got um, diarrhea, gastroenteritis, you've got uh, I, I mean the list just goes on there's about a hundred different viruses that you can possibly get from this rubbish that's piling up in our streets. Have there been any cases as you th that you know of that have been admitted into hospitals? There has not been any human cases reported as, as far. That's why Leanne, uh, our outbreak response team working with the city and the environmental inspectors, it's really to eliminate those. But our hospitals are on the alert uh, to look into this matter because uh, yes, indeed, this matter was brought to our attention as a result of a rodent which would have been picked up in one of the sites, particularly in Ivory Park in an era called Maibuye, and it was sent to the NICD for testing, and indeed it had tested pos positive for previous uh, a pneumonic plague. And therefore, uh, we then started getting worried that uh, if indeed this is has happened in one area, there's a possibility of it spreading around. Hence, we've decided to go out on a massive communications. We worked tirelessly Friday up until very late to look into what is that we must do uh, to make communities aware, also to have public meetings in those areas, and but also to appeal to communities that uh, where people can, they must take their rubbish into the nearest dumping site. And I'm told, including as I entered here, SAPC that some of the parking of the dumping sites are full are and therefore we full. need to make sure that that information is conveyed to the city and they are cleared as soon as possible but over and above that uh, where people cannot take these things with that dumping site they must be collected as soon as possible. Uh, of importance these diseases can be prevented and that's why um, uh, rolling out uh, the program of going out to communities is to really make people aware and to make sure that at least there's availability of water as, as, as quick as possible because these are water upon disease and you can prevent them uh, as soon as possible if you uh, have the right interventions in place. And most importantly, I mean, I do know that we were chatting about it all fair. I mean, you look at a, an area like Dipslur that mm. is, is almost, uh, it's, uh, I'm going to over-exaggerate a bit by saying it's almost buried in rubbish, but I mean, that's in certain areas, I can imagine the, 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 the piles of rubbish everywhere and the kids play there. And that's the problem, is that these little children, they don't know. They're busy playing in these rubbish dumps. And, I mean, they are the most vulnerable. They can get exceptionally sick. So, again, it's to educate parents to keep their kids away from Absolutely. this rubbish and mm. wash your hands. And they wash their hands. But also the important, the, the difficulty about this situation is that schools are on, uh, on recess now and kids have ample time and to be playing around. Therefore, uh, our cautious and empowering communities to understand what is going on is very important. And also to make sure that that the rubbish is collected in those areas. And I think of importance and the priority now is to make sure that rubbish is collected as soon as possible because, as I said, we can prevent these diseases from happening if indeed we, we implement the right measures, put the right measures in place and collect that. And people must also make sure that their rubbish is dumped at the right place at the right time. So where sites are full, the city must make sure that those interventions um, are escalated and they, they're implemented as agently. for people's faults and some years down the line it catches up with you then you didn't listen well it's a question of to be fair they greet you in English but the entire lecture is in Afrikaans are you saying therefore general that the Hawks did not leak the letter I must just say so Hawks did not leak this document okay but what a Mantashi doesn't think so uh, that one, um, for you are drawing me now to the politics. Myself, mm -hmm. I'm dealing with investigation. Okay. That one, politician would answer. 
Watch Question Time with me, Paul Tate, Monday to Thursday at 5.30 p.m. on the SABC News Channel. Welcome back. I'm Kendall Makamata with your Sports and Newsroom. Topping our sports bulletin stories is the Tswani Derby at the Lucas Masterpieces Muripa Stadium tonight between Supersport United and the University of Pretoria in the Nedbank Cup Round of 16 is crucial for more reasons than one. Besides bragging rights, the winner of tonight's match will join the seven teams that are already through to the quarterfinals of the competition. They're making their own luck, yeah? They're making their own luck. There will be seven top flight teams in the quarterfinals draw. The team that is known for its giant killing antics, Baroka FC, are the only side representing the lower leagues in the last eight of the Netbank Cup. Baroka have already knocked Chippa United and Golden Arrows out of this year's tournament. And the remaining Absa Premiership sites should be wary of the team that knocked out Kaiser Chiefs and Morocco Solos in the same competition in 2011. Tonight, Super Sports United will be looking to continue with their dominance over the University of Pretoria. Amata Tansa have won four of their last five clashes with the tax. Stuart Baxter's side booked their place in the last 16 with a 1 0 win over the low flying Morocco Swallows, while Sean Patlet's tax were locked the second division side, Fulukwani City Rovers 5 0. The two Pretoria teams will lock horns at the Lucas Moripe Stadium in Atridgeville, and the kickoff will be at 7 30 pm. Both sides want to book a spot in the quarterfinals draw that will be held on Thursday at 7 pm. Now, midfielder Kamohelo Mukocho has announced his retirement from international football. He says he won't be available for call ups. That's until circumstances change. Mukocho has been at loggerheads with the national coach, Sheikh Mashaba, who he accused of never really giving him a chance in the Bafana Bafana squad. He's used his Instagram account to announce how upset he is at not being given opportunities. Mashaba has previously said that he looked sluggish which angered Mukocho, who plays for FC Twente in the Dutch Eredivisie. Staying with football news, defending champions Barcelona are eager to bounce back against rivals Atletico Madrid in a Champions League quarterfinal first leg clash at the new camp tonight. This after the El Clasico loss to Real Madrid on Saturday ended their unbeaten 39-match run. In tonight's other clash, Bayern Munich host Benfica at the Allianz Arena. Barcelona have dominated recent meetings between the two top Spanish sides, winning each of their last six clashes under the guidance of coach Luis Enrique. Barca are six points clear of Atletico at the top of La Liga and insist the recent loss to Real was just a temporary setback. We don't need to be cheered up emotionally or physically. The squad is physically very well prepared. We have proved it during these months. We have a unique opportunity to play a great match and set the bar high. Meanwhile, Atletico believe their hosts will be playing at their highest level. We believe that playing the first leg at home will make them go for the match. We are optimists. We know it's a difficult match against a very strong rival, but I believe in my team. Pero creo mucho en mi equipo. Bayern Munich are overwhelming favourites at home against Benfica. They've comprehensively beaten the Portuguese side in their last three home matches and have never lost to the visitors in six games. But the Germans remain cautious. I know how good Portuguese football is. I know how physical they are, what a good team they are. I trust my team. I have a lot of hope, but I don't feel like the favourite at all. I never do. But we'll have to play this match and we'll have to play two good matches. Both matches get underway at quarter to nine tonight. Liesl Zankel, SABC News. And so here's a quick reminder of the fixtures, the UEFA Champions League fixtures 
for the next two nights. As you've just heard, uh, at the Allianz Arena, we've got Bayern Munich against Benfica. Then uh, Barcelona, they'll be trying to wreak some sort of revenge from the other Madrid team. That's Atletico this time at the Camp Nou. Both matches kicking off at a quarter to nine. Tomorrow night, also kicking off at a quarter to nine. At the Parc de France is PSG against Manchester City. Manchester City is where Pep Guardiola, Pep Guardiola will be going through in the European summer. The Volkswagen Arena is a scene of the action between VfL Wolfsburg and Real Madrid at a quarter to nine as well tomorrow night. Now Chelsea fans will be very happy to hear that they've now got a coach. Italian Antonio Conte has been officially named as Chelsea's next head coach with a three-year contract beginning after the European Championship. Conte, age 46 and currently the head coach of Italy, will take over from interim manager Gus Hiddink after the June 10 to July 10 tournament in France. The Chelsea website quoted the Italian as saying that he's very excited about the prospect of working at Chelsea Football Club. Proud of having been the coach of the national team of his country, he said only a role as attractive as manager of Chelsea could follow that. Much like many people in football these days, he has a cloud hanging over him though. The announcement came on the same day that Conte was due to go on trial, charged with failing to report knowledge of match fixing when he was in charge of Siena in 2011. He has said he is innocent. The trial is part of a criminal investigation involving more than 100 people. Chelsea has been led by Henning since December when Jose Mourinho was dismissed because of the club's disastrous initial defense of its Premier League title. Now, under the Dutchman, the Blues have not lost a Premier League match this year, but remain 10th with 44 points from 31 matches, and they've been knocked out of both the FA Cup and the Champions League. As manager of Juventus, Conte led the club to three successive domestic league titles. Now, with just two days to the PGA Masters at the Augusta National Golf Club in uh, Georgia, U.S., the tournament is shaping up as one of the best in recent memory, with all of the, leading, of the game's leading players having produced superb form over the past three months. World number three, Rory McIlroy is the only player ranked in the top six who has not claimed at least one tournament win so far this year. Joining him will be second-ranked American Jordan Spieth, the reigning Masters champion, as well as world number four, Bubba Watson, a double winner at Augusta National, and Zach Johnson, the 144th British Open champion. You know what? I, have, <laughs> I saw the Claret Jug last night for the first time in a long time. I might try to introduce it to Mr. Green Jacket, if you will. Um, that's probably a rare thing. I don't know history all that well, but my guess is that doesn't happen that, that often. And that's why we leave it with the sports. Uh, we'll take a quick look at the weather, and then we'll close off the show. Stay tuned. Well, that's your weather continental, and that's how we end the show for today. Very interesting discussion we had today on the show, of course, talking about gangs uh, in Cape Town specifically. Very interesting discussions we had, and a number of comments uh, in relation to gang, gangs that we have in the country, Renee. Yes, quite right, Alves. Very important discussion we're having, we had today. 
a lot of stakeholders, you know, speaking about the yep. gang activities, especially in Cape Town, but not just in Cape Town, now in the rest of uh, the country. And we will take that discussion even further, Kendall. I think it's we'll symptomatic of where the society is that uh, this, this infestation of gangs is happening. Thank you. Elvis? We'll take that discussion definitely further with the author of the book, and we'll have him on our book slot sometime or the other, perhaps this week or even next week. But stay tuned here on your favorite channel. From myself, Elvis Preslin. And me, Renee Vest. We'll see you tomorrow, same time, same place. Ciao for now. Arrivederci.